All right, listeners, our sponsor is one of our favorite companies, Vanta, and we have something very new from them to share. Of course, you know Vanta enables companies to generate more revenue by getting their compliance certifications. That's SOC 2, ISO 27001. But the thing that we want to share now is Vanta has grown to become the best security compliance platform as you hit hypergrowth and scale into a larger enterprise. It's kind of wild. When we first started working with Vanta and met Christina, my gosh, I mean, they had like a couple hundred customers, maybe. Now they've got 5,000, some of the largest companies out there. It's awesome. Yeah, and they offer a tremendous amount of customization now for more complex security needs. So if you're a larger company and in the past you showed Vanta to your compliance department, you might have heard something like, oh, well, we've already got a compliance process in place and we can't integrate this new thing. But now, even if you already have a SOC 2, Vanta makes maintaining your compliance even more efficient and robust. They launched Vendor Risk Management. This allows your company to quickly understand the security posture of the vendors that you're choosing in a standardized way that cuts down on security review times. This is great. And then on the customization front, they now also enable custom frameworks built around your controls and policies. Of course, that's in addition to the fact that with Vanta, you don't just become compliant once, you stay compliant with real-time data pulled from all of your systems, now all of your partner systems, and you get a trust report page to prove it to your customers. If you click the link in the show notes here or go to vanta.com slash acquired, you can get a free trial. And if you decide you love it, you will also get $1,000 off when you become a paying customer make sure you go to vanta.com slash acquired. Who got the truth? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Who got the truth now? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Sit me down. Say it straight. Another story on the way. Who got the truth? Welcome to episode six of Acquired, the podcast where we talk about technology acquisitions that actually went well. I'm Ben Gilbert. I'm David Rosenthal. And we are your hosts. Um, just a quick uh, administrative thing. If you like the show, we would love for you to rate us on iTunes. Um, been doing a lot of research on podcasts recently and kind of how, how the iTunes search algorithm works. And if you like it and you think other people would like it too, would love, love, love for you to leave a review. And likewise, as always, if you have feedback, hit us up on Twitter at acquired.fm or leave a comment on the website. Yes. So... This week we are, uh, I'd say we're timely, we're probably a month late. We, uh, we were talking about the Disney acquisition of Lucasfilm and all of Lucasfilm's franchises. Ben, I am your father. <laughs> Wait, that wasn't in the script. Cut. <laughs> all right. Um, David, over to you first for acquisition history and facts. Oh, man. Lucasfilm. Star Wars. What more can you say? So, um, George Lucas, obviously, founded Lucasfilm, uh, 1971 in San Rafael, California, which uh, has personal significance for me and my family. That's where my wife is from, where my in-laws live. Um, and David, where did you watch Star Wars? And I was going to say, <laughs> episode seven, um, we, went, uh, we went over the holiday break to the theater in Corte Madera that uh, George Lucas himself uh, helped renovate uh, for the, I believe for the prequels when they came out. It's a one screen theater uh, in Marin and uh, it was amazing. There's a great Vanity Fair article about this theater um, and, uh, and the work that Lucas has done on it. Um, super fun. So 19, early seventies uh, Lucas, uh, Lucas founds Lucasfilm uh, and the first project that the company does is American Graffiti, uh, which comes out in 1973. And then the next, uh, the next film that the company produces, 1977, is A New Hope. Well, well it was I guess Star it was Wars. called Star Wars at the time. <laughs> we know it as A New Hope. Uh, on this podcast, it's just called Star Wars, David. Ah, all right, Ben. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and then since then, over the years, I mean, pretty incredible what this company has uh, has produced both itself and what's come out of it i mean we've already this is our second episode about a lucasfilm company uh a disney acquisition yeah disney acquisition of a lucasfilm company <laughs> i was gonna try and catch you there on uh well david i think you mean because pixar was also acquired yeah. by disney 
but was also spun out of Lucasfilm. Yeah, well, essentially, I mean, you could argue started at Lucasfilm. Um, the, the the company and the product itself, I believe, was started at Lucasfilm. Yeah. So I guess, you know, I guess uh, they just took two shots at acquiring Lucasfilm. Yeah, piece exactly. Piece. <laughs> um, do you know what else came out of Lucasfilm? Mm. That is that is no longer part of the company. Industrial Light and Magic. That is yes, but company. that's part of the company. This came out of Industrial Light and Magic specifically. Mm, I have no idea. Photoshop. What Adobe? Not Adobe. Photoshop. What, did Adobe acquire Photoshop? Adobe from acquired Lucasfilm? Photoshop. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, there's another episode coming. Yeah. Too. I believe John. I believe John Knowles uh was uh an employee of ilm and uh one uh summer uh i believe as part of a movie project um i didn't didn't read the full history online uh wow. needed this piece of software so he wrote it and then sold it to adobe crazy yeah pretty incredible company i think we know what's coming next for disney <laughs> <laughs> Among uh so those great uh organizations aside, other things that, that Lucasfilm uh contains, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, ILM obviously, uh Skywalker Sound, uh which is uh film and TV sound production, um quite large video game uh publishing and, and development arm, uh which now post acquisition has been mostly outsourced to EA by Disney. Um, animation arm licensing, um, and uh, and then the other company to come out of Lucasfilm was THX, the sound uh, consumer sound company, named for George Lucas's first film in film school, THX 1138. Did not know that. <laughs> so acquisition um, in 2011. This is a great story. Uh, Star Tours, which uh, I've done many many times, most recently just a few weeks ago in December um, uh, was being revamped at Disney world in, uh, in Florida and George Lucas flies out to come go to the premiere of the new version, the new revamped star tours ride. And uh, while he's there, he's talking with Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney and mentions to him that uh, he's thinking about retiring and maybe selling Lucasfilm. And, um, and that was, uh, that was summer, uh, I believe, of 2011, and uh, and then about a year later, a little over a year later, October 2012, Disney announces the acquisition, 4.1 billion dollars. Ooh, pretty penny. And Lucas gives quotes in an interview saying he would never dreamed of selling it to anyone else. Would have been pretty hard for him to sell it to anybody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting because I think the we'll get a little bit into Bob Iger, but I mean, the, there's fascinating history there. There's a 20 year old relationship where um, Bob Iger was working at ABC and actually greenlit the uh, the television show Young Indiana Jones for George Lucas, which did not go so well. But he he uh, kind of stuck with him through at least the first season, and a, a, uh, there's always goodwill between uh, between Lucas and, and the trust that he and he and Iger had that that uh, eventually kind of led them here. Yeah. Um, interestingly, though, and I didn't realize this till we started researching this episode. Um, Disney uh, obviously spends one point or four point one billion dollars to acquire Lucasfilm, um, and acquires a lot within that. All the properties we just mentioned, ILM and Skywalker Sound and whatnot, that hadn't been spun out. Um, but the distribution rights to the original star wars movies uh were held by fox and uh still are uh oh, wow so disney was really making a big bet on the future with this acquisition yeah because it's easy to to justify buying that existing cash cow you know that there's there's pretty much no chance that uh that yeah, those movies are ra stop raise so your anything. hand if in anticipation of the force awakens you purchased per digital purchased <laughs> uh the uh the star well, wars collection it was the, my yeah, hands in the air both of us that well I, I went to watch it on itunes and the only way that i could do it was like some massive three-pack collector's edition really expensive digital download i mean they so, i sprung for the six-pack on amazon oh nice so so that when i bought that f through apple on the apple tv is that through fox Mon that money's going to fox watching we watched four five and six again Actually, that this isn't fully true. I had I watched the despecialized editions, but also I'm not going to get into that. That's a problem. <laughs> but 
Yeah, that's crazy. So Fox was actually capitalizing yeah, on so the Fox, that opportunity. Yeah, so Fox, I got to imagine Fox made a significant amount of money in the lead up to The huh. Force Awakens. Huh. Uh, that doesn't include, uh, that. do you know if that includes merch from those original characters? Like if you're selling, if they're selling a episode for Han Solo toy. Yeah, that's a good question. I, um, I think this is on the Wikipedia article about the acquisition, but... Um, David's giving me homework. Yeah, giving us all homework. <laughs> I believe I read in there that um, that at least for episode four, I think there's a special deal for episode four that Fox might be even getting those ancillary rights as well. Hmm. Hmm. Um, well, you want to keep going with the... Uh... Let's keep going. So, Ben, what's your category? Hmm. So... As a reminder, we've got... People, technology, product, business line, and the all-powerful other. This, to me, is a product acquisition in the near term, but it's a lot more in the the kind of far-reaching future. I mean, the way that Disney learned from Pixar and was able to produce in Disney Creative Studios, not in Pixar, Frozen, and put that at the center of the company and, and have that insane cats like 1.4 billion or something 1.3 so somewhere in there insane cash cow and frozen you know disney learned from that acquisition without messing with pixar too much and that is a bob Iger thing i mean i think that yeah. when bob Iger took over from michael eisner as ceo he's largely returning to the company's roots and that there's this incredible diagram that d- shows disney's business model and their the the ecosystem thinking and how everything goes and everything we else. should link to this yeah, online we and we, on twitter we will. We'll it's put it in the show notes awesome yeah and on twitter it's it's a it's amazing like uh, any any anybody who's ever been pitched a company and wondered ooh what's the lock in what are the network effects you know how how does this company build a moat around itself yeah. disney has this unbelievable ecosystem where everything flows into each other and the the center of the whole thing as as illustrated in this diagram is phenomenal content in feature length films and that's something that's escaped them for a, a long time. I mean, if you look at yep. if you look at Disney's revenues right now, one half are from cable subsidiaries, from affiliate money that they get when you know. You're, Which you're, probably ninety percent is ESPN. Yeah, uh, fifty uh, percent, oh, like 50%, a little over fifty percent. Well. Yeah, but you know, ESPN is is a quarter of Disney's revenue, and if you look every year, it's cord cutting, money's going away. Like that future was not sustainable, and it was drifting far from Disney's original roots. So putting incredible content and feature length films back at the center of the business model is a total change of direction for Disney, and and something that. Um, Bob Iger really kind of came in and shook everything up and, and, uh, and did. And he gave a lot of autonomy to all the individual groups. So, uh, you know, I, the way that Pixar was left alone, the way that Lucasfilm was left to do its thing, the, the incredible long-term thing, if they can pull it off, is sort of reverse acquiring the things that made that incredible content and letting them produce incredible content in-house. Because hmm. right now they, they bought the Star Wars product, but they have not sustainably proven and of course this takes a lot of time that they can now take the muscle of what that made that content incredible and and make that something that is something they can produce on their own in the future yeah you're raising a couple interesting themes that i i've been noodling on about this um so one i would my my category so you said product uh you said product today and business line in the future or yeah i guess you know, I think it sticks with product, but yeah. I think it's that that sort of reverse infection thing, like the the Apple to next. Like can yep. can the 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 productiness, the productness that makes Disney and 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 uh or that makes Pixar and Lucasfilm what they are, and I guess you could throw Marvel in there yep. too. Like we might have to do a uh, complete the trilogy yeah, here at will. some point and do Marvel. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, yeah. interestingly, just almost about the same price that Disney paid for Marvel as they did for Lucasfilm. Yeah, we're gonna have to do an episode on that. So, uh, at the end of the day, I think it's product uh, that they get this product, but the ultimate thing that will prove that this this uh, spree of acquisitions and this business strategy was successful is can Disney reacquire that muscle to build their own incredible content of all types henceforth? Yep, and you know, I think. Um, uh, I basically think the same thing. My my frame on it that I was going to say is is this is a product acquisition. But what the product is is the product is the juice that flows through the the Disney flywheel. 
Uh, and uh, this diagram that Ben was talking about, Walt Disney illustrated it by hand. It's actually, it's beautiful. There's Mickey's and Minnie's yeah, and turns Tinkerbell's. Turns out the man was a good illustrator. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, all throughout it. But it's this amazing um, uh, just document of, of business strategy. And, um, and, 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 and what it is is a flywheel. I've been thinking a lot about flywheels over the past few months inspired by um, – inspired by the everything store reading the everything store and thinking about amazon and the amazon flywheel and and the, the definition basically being you know how do you create this dynamic in a business where you've got different pieces of the business and if you push on one piece of the business it accelerates the whole system so like in amazon it's you know lower prices lead to more consumers which lead to more suppliers in the marketplace which uh um and leads to more leverage over those suppliers uh, which enables you to charge lower prices, which gets you more consumers, which gets you more suppliers and more leverage and on and on and on and on. For Disney, um, you know, the, the actual diagram is quite complicated, but the nodes in their business are films and, uh, tent pole to use the media industry term going way back to my days as a media investment banker here. Um, uh, content and, and franchises at the center and then, the parks and the rides and television and music and merchandising uh, and um, and publications, you know, comic books uh, and, and everything flowing through that system. And so to me, Star Wars is like just a great um, uh, juice is probably the wrong word, but like a, a great car to put on that track. Yeah, I like that way of thinking about it, too. All right, next section. Uh, technology themes. Uh, what would have happened otherwise? Oh yeah, which we almost skipped, but I think could be interesting here. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure, David, and I totally agree. Um, what would have happened otherwise? So Lucas sat on this for I don't know how long. Uh, from uh, uh, forty years. Yeah, but from not he he started saying in ninety seven. Um, no plans to make the sequel cr- trilogy. You know, I've made the original. Oh, set on Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, we haven't seen anything since since 1997. And he's been adamantly saying, I will never produce more Star Wars, blah, 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 blah. And he's also been saying. I'm glad he didn't. <laughs> Howard the Duck. Uh, and not only that, saying that he wouldn't, but saying that uh, he wouldn't license it to anyone else either. And, you know, I, I think that maybe that's just like that'll wear out over time and this thing has too much value not to go back and remilk and they would have uh, sold it to somebody else. But I think the circumstances were unique that this is exactly the sort of thing that Disney was, was um, acquiring as part of its new strategy going forward, that there was a relationship and trust there from, from Lucasfilm, not only with um, the relationship with Iger, but also, you know, that, um, you know, they, they watched uh, uh, Lucas watched jobs take Pixar from him <clears throat> be extremely product focused about it and very hands on and very um, intentional to keep that thing separate and then watch the fact that Disney was able to shelter it. And when Disney was able to keep that thing, thing separate and nurture what made it special. And, you know, I don't, I get the sense that Lucas doesn't have that trust lightly, that this wouldn't have been sold to someone that he didn't feel would, would, you know, keep it in that sort of form. So this was inevitable. Well, I don't think it would have been Disney or no one, but I. It's hard to imagine this falling into place with a company other than Disney. Could you imagine uh, Fox owning Star Wars? Well, the, well, I mean, what if? I mean, this is that's just as crazy as five years ago saying, "Can you imagine Disney owning Star Wars?" Yeah, but but I mean, like there was Disney and Lucasfilm have always had a tight relationship. I yeah. mean, there's the Star Tours ride, there's the Indiana Jones rides, you know. Um, well, is it possible that um, Lucasfilm would just not have produced more films? That George Lucas would have retired? It would have made boatloads of money off the mm, merch off forever. ILM. Yeah, yeah, and like it's just not a company that produced films anymore. It was a defunct. Film yeah, industry. it's interesting, right? And that kind of gets to um, if you think about acquisitions as a form of investing, which they should be. Um, it's just one that you know, most companies tend to be pretty bad at. Um, you know, the, at the core of investing is about identifying. It's about identifying mispriced assets. And so, if you if you're Disney, Bob Iger, and Disney's famed technology and and strategy group and M and A group, um, and you're looking at Lucasfilm, and 
the worth of Lucasfilm sitting there as an independent entity was X, call it 4.1 billion. But was that mispriced relative to the opportunity uh, that Lucasfilm had? I think, you know, if, if the force awakens is any indication, uh, uh, and, uh, and, um, you know, you, I, I think that the not so secret secret in, uh, that I am just like beyond excited about is, you know, we're not going to have to wait too long to see star Wars land and, <laughs> and, uh, all the spinoff movies that they've already announced and everything coming down the pipe. I don't know. I mean, oh, this is the part where I'm going to say there's a spoiler alert. So here's a couple seconds. If you'd like to turn the podcast off. If Disney didn't acquire Lucasfilm and no one did and it laid dormant, then we would have Han Solo forever and Han Solo wouldn't be dead. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so sad. Well, you know, the, um, I, I saw in doing research for this, uh, I I think the second Star Wars spinoff movie that Disney's going to make is a, a Han Solo chronicle. Yeah. The first being Rogue One and the second being the first of the uh, chronicles following Han Solo. Man. So that's this kind of amazing. I mean, we, we we've got five films queued up before 2020. I mean, let's let's review the finances so far from The Force Awakens. So already it's made 1.78 billion on That's record. incredible. Yeah, recording this on January 14th. Um that's including domestic and international, not including any merchandise. Less than 1 month. <laughs> yeah. Just <laughs> box office receipts. On a 200 million dollar budget. Now, if you look at the prequels as a whole, remember that's amazing. Well, yeah, it's the most incredible film, you know, as a business ever created on, yeah. on every metric, yeah. literally every metric. So, you know, four point one billion. That's that's the number. To Not hit to mention, here at some point. as as I alluded to earlier, uh, Jenny and my wife and I went to Disney World over New Year's, which was amazing, and the number of lightsaber kylo ren lightsabers with uh with cross guards and having a crossbow it's a cross guard is so stupid <laughs> you're just gonna cut yourself it doesn't bode well when they're hot lasers what well, when it comes uh it, it's useful in the one of the battle scenes uh i think it does more harm it's like uh, we can well, we could have a whole different podcast about this <laughs> that could be our next podcast all right so vote in the comments if you want to hear it <laughs> So we're trying to get to 4.1 billion, right? We're already 1.78 of the way there, minus the 200 they spent on it. I mean, it, it it's not quite like that, but if you want to pencil it out, if if you compare that to all of the 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 prequels, the first one, uh, which it's it's hard even speaking of these when really they don't exist, but the the um uh first prequel made a billion dollars, the second 848 million, the second 649 billion. So total the prequel trilogy made 2.5 billion on on um, theater tickets, and like I, we could see that alone from the Force Awakens easily. I think like, before we get any distribution outside of theaters, and so we're already looking at that. Um, the Economist quotes that uh, they they imagine that um, five billion in Star Wars licensed products will be sold in 2016. I, and I don't, I, you know, judging by your experience at Disney World and and um, the the Star Wars toasters and uh, like everything we're seeing everywhere, you know, Disney has the most incredible licensing team in the world. Yeah, and uh, they're taking full advantage of Star Wars. It, it is, it is. Um, they they got an Instagram bargain on their hands. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe not quite Instagram. This is a great time to tell you about one of our very favorite companies, Crusoe. So Crusoe, as listeners know by now, is a clean compute cloud provider specifically built for AI workloads. NVIDIA is one of their major partners, and literally Crusoe's data centers are nothing but racks and racks of A100s and H100s. And because Crusoe's cloud is purpose-built for AI and run on wasted, stranded, or clean energy, they can provide significantly better performance per dollar than traditional cloud providers. Yes, we talked about that on our ACQ2 episode with Crusoe CEO Chase Lockmiller. The other element that makes Crusoe special is the environmental angle. Crusoe, of course, locates their data centers at stranded energy sites. So think oil flares, wind farms that can't use all the energy they generate, etc., and uses that power that would otherwise be wasted to run your AI workloads instead. Yep. Obviously, it's a huge benefit for the environment and for customers on costs since Crusoe doesn't rely on the energy grid. 
Energy is the second largest cost of running AI after, of course, the price you pay NVIDIA for the chips. And these lower energy costs get passed on to customers. It's super cool that they can put their data centers out there in these remote locations where, quote unquote, energy happens, as opposed to the other hyperscalers such as AWS and Google and Azure, who need to build their data centers close to major traffic hubs where the Internet happens because they are doing everything in their clouds. Yep. If you, your company, or your portfolio companies would like to use the lower cost and more performant infrastructure for your AI workloads, go to crusocloud.com slash acquired, that's C-R-U-S-O-E cloud.com slash acquired, or click the link in the show notes. Let's move on to uh, tech themes, because uh, I think this is a good um, a good segue. Um, you know, as I was thinking about this, you know, what technology theme does this illustrate for you? I was sitting here and I was thinking, you know, this is our sixth episode. We should have saved this for episode seven. That would have been appropriate, but not as timely. Yeah. Um, (laughs) And uh, and the companies we've done so far for a show that's ostensibly about technology acquisitions, we've done Pixar, Instagram, Twitch, Bungie, Siri, and now Lucasfilm. You could argue that that's, that's five media companies and one technology company. In, in Siri being the technology company and everything else being, yes, a technology company, but also a media company. Um, and what's interesting for me, you know, th- this highlights a couple of things, which we've mentioned uh, before on this on this show. Um, but one, you know, um, as a, uh, I don't know if I need to pay any royalties on this phrase to Andreessen Horowitz, they probably trademarked it, but like software is eating the world. Um Two, uh, I actually like this phrasing of it better. Uh, this is from an old version of the Sequoia website um, that they've since changed. But they used to have a section on there called um, oh, something like uh, what we believe or like what we've learned over 40 years of venture capital or something like that. And, and uh, one of the phrases was technology is the best amplifier of a business. Mm, very rings true of Paul Graham's recent technology is a lever. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And and if you think about technology as a lever um, for it always has been for Lucasfilm. Um, you, oh, my gosh. ILM. Like they, they, they were doing things that were Pixar. absolutely unheard of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so both within within Lucasfilm itself, but then also, you know, now as, as part of Disney, I mean, uh, there's the whole Disney flywheel. But like, um, I think one of the coolest parts about uh, episode seven or your coolest, you know, sort of things that, um, business things that happen around it is, uh, Disney didn't do a big marketing blowout budget for it. Like who in the world didn't know that the force awakens was coming out this past December. What do you mean? They didn't, they didn't do a big marketing budget. Like I, there was more media for the force awakens than I've ever seen for a movie before. Yes. And it was free from technology, from social media. Uh, so they, there's they there's had a tremendous amount of, of earned they, media there, but they a tremendous amount of earned media, and and of course they had a they had a marketing budget for for the film, and I believe it was about a hundred million dollars, but it was on the low end for big tentpole movie releases. And actually, mm-hmm. there are a few interviews with Bob Iger about this, um, or stories. There's one in the Wall Street Journal, and I think one in Fortune, um, where uh, he he really pushed the company to be thoughtful about this and say, hey, do we need to spend a huge amount of like traditional marketing on on the force awakens yeah it's really interesting i mean i saw there's definitely some some paid media where or or leveraging of internal assets where i mean at sports center the day before the movie came out there was a 15 minute segment in the middle of sports center on the uh, the athletic training behind star wars as a gigantic star it was incredible and i'm like i that's a i need to watch very nice disney owned property but i mean the the amount of like um memes that started from it of like people taking pictures of weird star wars products and then posting them on instagram and twitter and like that there was that hashtag was like only disney or something like that and i mean that reddit was just they, they 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 knew where people were and they took full advantage of their ability to spread content virally. Yep. Um, second theme for me, uh, which I've already talked about is, is just the illustrating the power of the flywheel, probably more so here than, uh, than technology being an amplifier because at, at the core Lu- Lucasfilm, probably less so than, than Pixar and, and, and Twitch, um, is, is, is a technology business. I mean, it is, um, 
but uh but the, but the power of the flywheel both within lucasfilm and within disney is incredible here yeah it's interesting i was thinking um you know a lot of times we talk about themes we talk about the technology themes and other ones the acquisition themes what, this almost feels like a facebook style acquisition where disney is acquiring a portfolio of you know third party brands that they really are learning from but not not roping in in the wrong way they're leveraging the disney assets and the things that disney does best merchandising and a lot of this media distribution but they're not well actually here's the here's the best litmus test of all there was no disney uh, logo, logo on, uh, at the yeah. beginning of Star Wars. I mean, yeah. we didn't have 20th Century Fox. We didn't get the fanfare and like, God did my heart sink. But I'll take it as a compromise for we didn't get the castle. And yeah. it is, it was, it was, uh, <laughs> of course, I couldn't stop thinking about this during the movie of how good Disney is at, at just like letting this thing be what it is, contributing its own assets where they make sense and learning from it in a very slow, hands off way. And the, the trend there is, I mean, that, Facebook is is the shining example so far of of um, companies that know how to do really good kind of siloed acquisitions where you don't mess it up too much. And like, look at Instagram from the day it was yeah. acquired to today. You know, you, you look at WhatsApp from the day it was acquired to today. That is the theme of the modern acquisition that goes well. And I think it's a major theme of this show. Um, you know, look at the, all the episodes we've done. Uh, you know, they've all the successful deals have all been this style of acquisition pixar instagram twitch bungie to an extent as we heard ed talk about you know they had their own office uh they were knocked down the walls um you know they kept their culture and, and then the the acquisition we did that hasn't gone so well is the one that didn't take this approach in siri yeah and i think to distill it down to a more catchy thing than that long version i articulated before i think it's amplify quickly integrate slowly yeah because there's no question that disney is integrating pixar lucasfilm marvel look at the rides yeah absolutely absolutely i just never want to see a world where luke skywalker faces off against iron man right like we we better not see combining of universes I think we'll have to go back and revise this episode <laughs> yeah, if that we're happens. Moving from the CDN. Yeah. <laughs> I never got Batman versus Superman. Uh, <laughs> All right. On that note, any other themes you want to add, Ben? Um, I don't think so. Great. <sighs> What's your grade? I'm going to give it an A and not an A plus. Um, even though financially, I think spectacular, but I think the thing that we will see in the future is, is Disney able to produce content like this without gigantic acquisitions from now on? Because there's only so many pieces of gigantic content houses that they can pick up. Um, there was some stat I was looking at the the top 25 movies from last year and, and like 21 or 22 of them were rebooted or yeah. at the very i guess star wars isn't a reboot but unoriginal storylines unoriginal assets and you compare that with like 1985 and it was like three of the top 25 were sequels and you know we're seeing the same thing happening um in entertainment today that's happening elsewhere and it's yep. y- you 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 in movies, you know, they're going to spend one to two hundred million dollars producing what's going to be for sure a big hit. And all the experimentation has moved to television. So that's the whole kind of like startup scrappy. We're going to try one little thing, small investment. If it works, we'll double down. Like, what does that look like for feature film content in the future? And when Disney runs out of Star Wars movies to make and runs out of Star Wars like franchises to buy. Mm-hmm. Well, how do they continue and, and what does that flywheel look like after 2025? Yep. I, I, uh, I was going to go down the same path. I'm going to give it an A minus for, but for, for this reason, um, thinking about Lucasfilm versus Pixar, um, Lucasfilm is a depreciating asset. 
it was a mispriced one that Disney correctly identified, and they're going to be able to get a ton of juice out of it by feeding it through their flywheel, and that'll go on and on and on for a long time. Um, but fundamentally, there's not a uh, – it is just content. There's not a moat there. You know, um, Maybe there is an, an ILM um, in their technology to the extent that that's differentiated, um, but the moat is Disney. Um, and what's interesting is Pixar, I think was different. Um, you know, their, their moat was people, which is slightly, arguably more ephemeral, more ephemeral than, um, an organizational or a process or a technology moat. But Pixar, uh, for Disney, I think has been an appreciating asset, uh, because the process that, it brought the ability to continually generate new, relevant, successful content. Um, maybe they can apply that to Lucasfilm, um, but I don't think Lucasfilm itself is going to be that gift that keeps on giving. What are you talking about? Indiana Jones is going to be like... Yeah, but that's just one <laughs> more... <yeah. laughs> just one more uh, existing content franchise. Yeah, like, will Lucasfilm, the division of Disney, come up with an entirely new franchise? And will they go spend $100 million to make that movie that is the new Lucasfilm franchise? Unlikely. The question is, will they be able to do it successfully within Walt Disney Studios? Yeah. And here's the question, right? I mean, financially, probably Lucasfilm in the medium term is going to be a better acquisition than Pixar. Um and, uh, but in the long, long term, in terms of like extending Disney's competitive advantage and, uh, and moat around their, around, you know, moat around their flywheel to mix two metaphors. Um, I feel <laughs> like, I feel like Pixar is going to add longevity and Lucasfilm is like a, uh, it's like a, like a turbo boost. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Well, that's all I got. Me too. On that note, happy 2016, everybody. May the force be with you. Who got the truth? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Who got the truth now? Huh. All right, listeners, we have a longtime favorite acquired company to tell you about, Modern Treasury. Modern Treasury is the software platform that turns money movement operations into code. Yeah. For years now, services like Stripe, Adyen, and Square have enabled developers to accept credit card payments in apps. But that's only the tip of the iceberg of what a business needs to fully handle the movement of money in and out of their company. Those payment actions from Stripe and Adyen, etc., flowed through to ledger systems and then reconciliations, compliance verifications, and that's before any cash actually moves between institutions, which of course involves banking operations. Yes, their APIs of course work with Plaid, Stripe, Intuit, etc., but also with their incredible banking partner network with over 30 banks, meaning that for the first time, you literally can turn your banking operations at any of those institutions into software. This means faster payments, easy adoptions of new payment rails when they come out, like FedNow. It means automatic reconciliation and real-time financial data. This lets you move money at the speed of software, which, as we now know, after the first half of 2023, being able to move money fast is very important. Yes, we love Modern Treasury so much. The founders and really the whole team have become close friends of Ben and mine really back to when they first got started. And this is a very cool full circle moment that just happened. We just emceed their first big conference here in San Francisco, Transfer, which happened at the beginning of June. Yes. If your business involves money movement, be it a marketplace, fintech platform, real estate, lending, investing, or anyone who reconciles or moves money, go on over to moderntreasury.com slash acquired and make sure that when you get in touch, you tell them that Ben and David sent you. All right, listeners, our sponsor is one of our favorite companies, Vanta, and we have something very new from them to share. Of course, you know Vanta enables companies to generate more revenue by getting their compliance certifications. That's SOC 2, ISO 27001. But the thing that we want to share now is Vanta has grown to become the best security compliance platform as you hit hypergrowth and scale into a larger enterprise. 
It's kind of wild. When we first started working with Vanta and met Christina, my gosh, I mean, they had like a couple hundred customers, maybe. Now they've got 5,000, some of the largest companies out there. It's awesome. Yeah, and they offer a tremendous amount of customization now for more complex security needs. So if you're a larger company and in the past you showed Vanta to your compliance department, you might have heard something like, oh, well, we've already got a compliance process in place and we can't integrate this new thing. But now, even if you already have a SOC 2, Vanta makes maintaining your compliance even more efficient and robust. They launched Vendor Risk Management. This allows your company to quickly understand the security posture of the vendors that you're choosing in a standardized way that cuts down on security review times. This is great. And then on the customization front, they now also enable custom frameworks built around your controls and policies. Of course, that's in addition to the fact that with Vanta, you don't just become compliant once, you stay compliant with real-time data pulled from all of your systems, now all of your partner systems, and you get a trust report page to prove it to your customers. If you click the link in the show notes here or go to vanta.com slash acquired, you can get a free trial. And if you decide you love it, you will also get $1,000 off when you become a paying customer make sure you go to vanta.com slash acquired. Who got the truth? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Who got the truth now? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Sit me down. Say it straight. Another story on the way. Who got the truth? Welcome to episode seven of Acquired. I'm Ben Gilbert. I'm David Rosenthal. And we're your hosts. Today we sit here on the eve of the announcement that Google is the most valuable company in the world to tell you about Google's acquisition. Google announced that they were the most valuable company in the world? Uh, what? <laughs> Google announced earnings, and oh, yeah. people are speculating that it might... Uh, I haven't oh, looked at, when it opens checked tomorrow? The price. I haven't checked the stock price, but that it, Google's market cap might pass Apple's tomorrow. Ah, gotcha. So... Uh, Mr. Market will tell. Yeah, in... in uh, Steep contrast to what we normally do on this show. That is just conjecture and and uh, hypothesizing. We never conjecture on this show. <laughs> We're going to talk about um, kind of an older acquisition when when you uh, look at the the companies that we've looked at so far. Um, Google acquiring YouTube. David, why don't you uh, take it away with acquisition history and facts? Will do. So YouTube, this is a big one. Um, founded, uh, YouTube was founded early 2005 by two former engineers and one former designer from PayPal. Um, you know, part of the, uh, the much ballyhooed PayPal mafia. Um, and interestingly, we'll get more into this later. Um, YouTube was one of the very first investments at Sequoia by another member of the PayPal mafia, Roloff Botha. Um, I just keep it in the family. Um, so it was founded in early 2005. Uh, and, um, and then in November of 2005, uh, Sequoia and Roloff, uh, come in and they lead a $3.5 million series a, um, and, uh, and then a few months later, it was very, uh, very early growth days having just released the product, uh, when Sequoia leads the series a, a few months later, in December of 2005, SNL, uh, remember the Lonely Island days on SNL, the skit Lazy Sunday uh, was uh, comes out. And um, <laughs> Wait, it, so it only took us seven episodes to talk about Andy Samberg here yeah. on Acquired. <laughs> <laughs> Ironic, I know. <laughs> Editor's note, David looks like Andy Samberg. There should be no inside jokes in podcasting. Um. Lazy Sunday comes out and a whole bunch of people like video their TVs and post it to YouTube. And, uh, I don't know if this was in aggregate or just one of the versions of the clips of this clip of Lazy Sunday generates 7 million views on YouTube, which was huge. I mean, like there were only a hundred thousand people on the site before then. Yeah. I think even at acquisition, um, they had an audience of 72.1 million, but they, they were reporting 19.1 uh, monthly active users. So, I mean, to get that kind of view count that early. And that was even, you know, a year I'm before. sure it was a lot of college kids like me watching it over and over and over <laughs> again. <laughs> well, the amazing thing is thinking about watching it on, um, you know, people filming their TVs like that. That's like what Vines look like now. 
Yeah. You talk about a, a kind of the history rewriting itself. So on the back of Lazy Sunday, uh, among other uh, viral hits, uh, April 2006, the company raises an $8 million Series B, also from Sequoia with Artist Ventures, uh, um, which I believe led the round. Um, and by the summer of 2006, uh, YouTube is uh, has grown in July to uh, about 100 million video views a day, um, which is pretty incredible. And then, um, and a whole bunch of problems that arose with that, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, but, uh, very shortly after October 9th, 2006, uh, Google announces that they are going to purchase YouTube for $1.65 billion. Incredible. I mean, this is just over a year and a half after the founding of the company, literally in a garage. Um, they'd only raised 11 and a half million in venture capital. So I yep. mean, the, the multiple 11 and a half million to 1.65 billion. That's what? A hundred, a Xing. Pretty incredible. I mean, this kind of stuff, and this was 2006, this stuff didn't happen in 2006. I mean, after the, you know, the internet bubble, the lingering after effects are still, reverberating through the valley even a few years later and the idea that a company would go from founding to actually being sold to a real company google uh not just you know going public with funny money in uh um in 18 months for over one and a half billion dollars i mean it was crazy even even instagram was that we talked about on one of our first episode was such a splash of one billion dollars yeah, insane. So Google acquisition uh, closes by December of 2006. In March of 2007, Viacom files a $1 billion lawsuit against YouTube, accusing um, the company, uh, the directors, um, and I can't remember if Google was named in the suit or not, of knowingly and blatantly violating copyright laws and posting um, material like... Uh, SNL is an NBC property, not a Viacom property, but like Lazy Sunday, knowingly uh, allowing it to persist on the site, even though it didn't have uh, YouTube didn't have the copyright. Um, so, and, and that began this protracted battle over content rights and YouTube that really was only finally resolved in 2014, seven years later. I was whole series of dismissals and appeals and judgments and then finally the viacom and google settled in 2014 it's hard to believe it is okay so this lawsuit happens but which is you know we'll talk about in and of itself but there's this amazing byproduct of the lawsuit which is the disclosure process disclosure process and we get to see like it's just public in the public domain all of this incredible material and testimony about YouTube, um, about Sequoia's investment in YouTube, about the acquisition. Um, so, uh, you, you can find this online and we'll link to it in the, in the show notes. Um, as part of the discovery process, Google and Roloff's, uh, or sorry, uh, Sequoia and Roloff's, um, investment memo for the series A of YouTube, uh, is available. Uh, and it's a really incredible document. It is incredibly fun to read. I mean, I, I I was just looking over it preparing for this show, and the the key risks that they identify in here could not be more candid and could not be more real of concerns. I and mean, we're going to talk about this later in evaluating the the acquisition and where the world is today and all that. But you know, key risks: competition slash defensibility. Like here we are, what ten years after the acquisition, and Facebook is stealing video share yep. revenue. And like what the, I thought was really interesting and. In, uh, We'll talk more about this throughout the show, and I think especially in the, the themes. Um, but uh, in the memo, Roloff and Sequoia, when addressing competition and defensibility, they say the team will need to remain laser focused on improving the user experience, which isn't what you would really expect when you think about defensibility. Like in nowhere in this memo does it talk about network effects. And YouTube is, you know, on the surface, you would think network effects defensibility through having all the content, which leads to all the viewers, which gets more content. Um, but no, they're actually focused on improving the user experience. And I mean, that's not exactly how I would describe YouTube today. Like what, 
when I think about the things that make YouTube great, it has pretty much zero to do with the user experience of YouTube. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, YouTube has actually, I think, really failed. Like, who goes to YouTube.com and then discovers something or searches for something on YouTube? No, you come through other channels and then you leave. Yeah, I'm often... Well, I, this is... I want to say this for later, but I think it's, it's worth talking about now. The... I'm a little bit bearish on YouTube primarily because it's not a destination site. They are reliant on traffic from other channels, and those other channels, namely Facebook, where people go first to decide what they're going to be looking at, are having their own platforms and yep. actively pulling people onto those platforms. And can drive traffic. So, so YouTube is effectively you know, a super fancy CDN at this point. They, they're a, a place where the videos get hosted where people don't necessarily rely on going to YouTube for discovery or that being YouTube, told what they should watch or it's, yep. it's just un, uninteresting hosting that YouTube and Google pay for. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's free hosting. And I, you know, uh, if there was a better place, I think people would easily throw it up on that better place. Yeah. And, um, so, uh, we'll get into more of this in detail, but, um, back to another thing that's really interesting about this lawsuit is um we have there's a bunch of testimony from eric schmidt who was then the ceo of google and um uh as part of the lawsuit and he is interesting he testified uh that he told google's board in the uh the days leading up to the acquisition and as they were working on it that he thought youtube was worth about 600 to 700 million um and that as the deal progressed uh, Google decided that it had to pay more, literally a billion dollars more, um, to keep it from competitors. Uh, and that YouTube had indicated to Google, uh, that quote, uh, had indicated to us that they would be sold is what Eric says. Um, which is super interesting because, you know, there's these content rights issues swirling around the company. There's the massive hosting fees that they were paying at the time and are still continuing to pay. Um, and yet the, the growth was explosive and it's interesting that they essentially put themselves up for sale. Um, and that we have this, this testimony here, which is really cool. Well, do you think, I mean, one way that I would interpret that is we are going to be sold is we are going to go out of business unless we have someone that is financing all these lawsuits. <laughs> like th there, we have no well, that's option. That's what Viacom argued. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and ultimately lost we should say but um but yeah super interesting you've got this property this product that is clearly you know incredible product market fit growing like i don't know anything i, I think nothing that the internet had ever seen uh until that point i mean maybe i guess facebook existed then so it was probably growing at a similar rate um and yet had these massive existential questions that uh, even though it was a, a huge price, um, leads them to s actively try and sell the company only 18 months in. Yeah. And the interesting thing about the sale, too, it's almost entirely stock. It was only $15 yep. million in cash and the rest in, in stock. David, if you're Google, why do you do uh, such a stock-heavy transaction there? Well, uh, I don't know at the time. I mean, I don't know how much cash Google had on hand. Um Presumably a lot, but this was 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, and whether they could, uh, whether their treasury could, you know, how much cash they had on hand and how much cash of that was available and on U.S. soil and not right, in. Right, that's true. Um, yeah, maybe they had no choice. Yeah. But to me, I mean, like looking at that, Google was only going to go up. And it's easy to say that now looking at the skyrocketing that it's done. But if you're, you know, Larry Page, don't... I, you got to be optimistic there and you got to be able to see that your company is only getting get more valuable. It'd be interesting to go back actually and look at all these shares now and, and do the math and see um, what's the current value of that. It would also be interesting to look at, um, you know, we've mentioned Sequoia a lot in, in this show, uh, both in the past and this episode, but in particular because of this investment memo, um, you know, Sequoia is one of the largest shareholders in Google and, uh, I don't know if they were still shareholders at that time, but they have a history of keeping their public shareholdings, um, which would be very interesting that the largest investor in YouTube uh, might also have been the largest or one of the largest shareholders in Google at the time of this acquisition. Hmm. 
Interesting indeed. Okay, so 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 uh, just to wrap up. So what happened yeah. next? 2006 Time Magazine names quote you person of the year, but the cover is YouTube uh, and the theme of you and user generated content um, and and the growth just just continues on the product side. I mean, by May of 2010, so four years later, less than four years later. Um, they're up to YouTube is up to 14 billion video views a month from a hundred million four years earlier. Uh, by 2013, YouTube has a 1 billion monthly unique, uh, viewers, uh, visitors. Um, and, and the growth has just continued since then. Okay, cool. So I've heard you say a lot about views and viewers. Got to feed my family. Yeah. How do you feel about YouTube as a business? Well, here's what's really interesting and that's happened since then, especially, you know, we've done our episode on Twitch. Um, Netflix, you know, has also been built. Uh, well, Netflix as a digital streaming service mm-hmm. has been built uh, during this same time. Amazon stood up something from scratch in that time. Yep. You know, and, and YouTube is really one of the um, few if maybe only major video business well youtube and facebook um that are ad supported now um and i wonder if it's kind of been proven that direct payments are a better model for video on the internet um now obviously twitch has advertising but um as we talked about i think most of the commerce most of the dollars flowing through twitch are in the form of subscriptions yeah so you touched on two really interesting things there one in thinking about um YouTube as a, a, a profitable business, I think um, last year, there's not a lot of good stats on this sense, but in February of 2014, um, they were doing about $4 billion in revenue, but were um, pretty flat. I mean, they, they, they uh, I guess not flat as much as they were break-even business. Um, they, yeah, $4, four billion in revenue, growing fast, but uh, after payments to content creators and hosting costs and ad sales costs and all associated yeah. stuff about a break-even business, yeah. you know, zero profit. And so in the last year, uh, estimates that are that they are a $5 billion business, but again, still not a profitable one. Um, the interesting thing to think about there is what is their average revenue per user? And the information is pretty sparse on this, but I think uh, the latest numbers around kind of Facebook and Twitter are like, somewhere in the seven to nine dollar range for for those social services that are that are ad supported it's probably in that seven eight dollar range maybe a little bit less mm-hmm. because it's um you know the the ad units i would bet probably less because if in 2013 they had a billion unique visitors and if say they made five billion in revenue last year imagine that number of uniques has only gone up since 2013 so you're talking about less than five dollars per uh, per user. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see why, uh, YouTube red is a thing. So YouTube red is a a service they announced last year that you can pay $10 and get ad free YouTube. And it's their sort of answer for how do you get, um, YouTube, the, the music that is on YouTube as sort of a streaming service for when you're not actively watching a video, you don't want the ad interruptions, all that. So that's a $10 a month service on the one hand. And I, I'm going to call this short-sighted, but on the one hand, they need to do that to make it a profitable business. I mean, it's been a 10-year experiment here since the acquisition, and there's a lot of other ancillary benefits that Google gets out of having YouTube, but as the core business, not hugely profitable or profitable at all. So, you know, maybe moving to this other model gives them, uh, you know, more cash flows where they're able to be a, a profitable business. On the other hand, it flies directly in the face of YouTube as an ad platform. And yep. they're getting their highest value users, which are the people that the advertisers actually want to reach, to not see the ads. And to do brand advertising, you need enormous scale. I mean, Facebook and YouTube are two of the, on- the, the, the only properties in the world that can do it. And if YouTube starts dwindling the population of people, particularly on the um, you know, most affluent end that are actually seeing ads, they become a less valuable ad platform. So what we're seeing here as Google transitions to trying to make YouTube a profitable business with YouTube Red is potentially a huge shift in the entire strategy of what YouTube as a business is. Yeah. Um, I think that's exactly right. Um, and, uh, you know, 
video as incredibly compelling as it is and as large as it's become on the internet, mostly thanks to YouTube and all of these services, you know, Facebook video and Twitch um, and others that have sprung up in its wake, um, is it fundamentally though does have a different cost structure than other types of, of content on the internet. Yeah. I mean, if you just compare this to Instagram alone, you know, acquired for a um, billion dollars and then I think they projected it at um, making three three yeah. billion this year well and, and the and the cost structure is different on on two fronts you know one there's the hosting and then the delivery of the video which costs a lot more than text or, or static photos um, but two is is the content payments you know and YouTube has really been aggressively investing in this and it's not just payments to the professional media organizations of the world it's payments out to content partners that are uh, you know, once we, you know on Instagram, those people just post their post their content or Snapchat. You know, they're posting for free, for free, and, and on YouTube's YouTube that, paying them. That YouTube's splitting fifty five percent of their ad revenue out and paying it out to those producers. And and you know, we know um, on on Twitch, you know, lots of the most popular streamers have talked about how YouTube has approached them and offered them large payments, very large payments, uh, to stream on YouTube, and they're streaming for free on Twitch. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, the, the the whole Twitch live streaming thing is interesting in itself, but the even the um, kind of stored uh, archive video that that uh, YouTube is is that's their bread bread and butter. I mean, Facebook has a product that is pulling people away in huge numbers because that's everyone's first step. And I think that um, the stat that I recently saw was seventy percent of Facebook videos are uploaded natively. That used to be people embedding wow. YouTube videos, and it's just been this massive, massive shift. Yeah, pretty incredible. Well, I, I feel like we should uh, we should move on to acquisition category. But before we do, one more quick aside um, that I want to throw in. This is a particularly fun episode because my very first uh, job interview or interview for my very first job uh, when I worked at, at UBS in investment banking uh, after college, I was interviewing in... January 2007 and this acquisition acquisition had just been announced and and I did this as a case study in my interview. I thought man this was going to be like the best job ever. I could talk about like internet company strategy <laughs> and media and like this would be awesome and then I learned investment banking was actually something very different but <laughs> <laughs> but now you get to do a podcast. Now I get that, to do a so. podcast about it. <laughs> I also think right before we move on I I I didn't fully I guess I want to come around at that last point. Calling it short-sighted, that's assuming that they are straight sticking with being an ad platform and particularly a brand advertising platform. If there is some grander plan, you know, I, I think it's short-sighted if that's, if that's the current business. If there is a grander plan to move to more of a Spotify-type subscription business, which we'll see if they can, um, you know, whether that storm of the crazy yeah. margins that you have to pay out to content producers at that point. But, um, you know... it. It's short-sighted in that they maintain that same advertising platform strategy. This is a great time to tell you about one of our very favorite companies, Crusoe. So Crusoe, as listeners know by now, is a clean compute cloud provider specifically built for AI workloads. NVIDIA is one of their major partners, and literally Crusoe's data centers are nothing but racks and racks of A100s and H100s. And because Crusoe's cloud is purpose-built for AI and run on wasted, stranded, or clean energy, they can provide significantly better performance per dollar than traditional cloud providers. Yes, we talked about that on our ACQ2 episode with Crusoe CEO Chase Lockmiller. The other element that makes Crusoe special is the environmental angle. Crusoe, of course, locates their data centers at stranded energy sites. So think oil flares, wind farms that can't use all the energy they generate, etc., and uses that power that would otherwise be wasted to run your AI workloads instead. Yep. Obviously, it's a huge benefit for the environment and for customers on costs since Crusoe doesn't rely on the energy grid. Energy is the second largest cost of running AI after, of course, the price you pay NVIDIA for the chips. And these lower energy costs get passed on to customers. It's super cool that they can put their data centers out there in these remote locations where, quote unquote, energy happens as opposed to the other hyperscalers such as AWS and Google and Azure who need to build their data centers close to major traffic hubs where the internet happens because they are doing everything in their clouds. Yep. 
If you, your company, or your portfolio companies would like to use the lower cost and more performant infrastructure for your AI workloads, go to crusocloud.com slash acquired, that's C-R-U-S-O-E cloud.com slash acquired, or click the link in the show notes. Okay, acquisition category. David, you want to take it? Yeah, so um, I think the obvious one here is product. As a reminder, our our self-identified major categories are people, technology, product, business line, and other. Um, but I think I, you know, I think I'm actually going to go with other on this one. Um, and I think it's a little bit what you were talking about just now, Ben. Um, but there's, I'm not unique in coming up with this, and I, I was inspired by a few articles that I read in preparing for this show, but. People have been talking for years now about YouTube as Google's, quote, loss leader. Um, and I think that's an interesting um, way to look at it because um, if you think about Google as an ad sales machine, which it is, um, much of it self-serve, but a lot of it, you know, they have a huge ad sales force. Um, and you think of YouTube as a part of... Um, the 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 overall portfolio of products that that Google's uh, ad sales team is selling, even if the business itself isn't profitable as a as a business as a uh, and the product has huge problems, um, but it's really enabled Google to have um, uh, multiple types. You know, if you think about their their core search advertising and AdWords, and then the display network that they built up following the double click acquisition, um, and then now with video and YouTube. Um, I think it's, I think it's an interesting, you know, like I said, quote, loss leader product for Google. Yeah. I, I actually was going to go with other also, but for a totally different reason, the, um, they're able to bring data that they're getting from the videos that people are uploading and watching into the Google search algorithm on mm -hmm. all media types. And I think that sure they could do what they're doing with Twitter now and embed, um, kind of a passed along search to, to YouTube and re re return the first couple of videos. But what they're doing with, with the content on YouTube and the analytics and metrics of people watching these videos and understanding, you know, the topical things that are going on in each of these videos uh, is so much deeper than anything they'd be able to get with YouTube as an external company. So, um, you know, uh, again, probably primarily the product. Um, but I think yep. uh, other for, for both of those two reasons. And that also gets to uh, something I want to talk about in a minute, which is embeds. Um, yeah. Uh, but we'll get there in a minute. Uh, One point I want to make here. So Google was had been playing with a product for a few years called Google Video Search uh, yep. before they acquired YouTube. And interestingly enough, they actually left it running for like a year or two after the acquisition in its exact same form where you could actually upload videos to Google video and then left it up for, you know, uh, yep. much, much longer. And it's interesting. Schmidt so, actually talks about this in his testimony hmm. uh, saying that one of the reasons that they were so compelled to pursue YouTube was that it was clear that YouTube was growing way faster and had way better engagement than Google video. Yeah. So what were they doing wrong? I mean, why did they need YouTube and what, why couldn't they do it with Google video? Where did they fail there? I don't know. This is a really interesting question. Um, part of me wonders if it is like, you know, kind of related to the Lonely Island, Lazy Sunday, like it kind of just got virality and it started taking off. And I mean, I remember I was in college, you know, when this was happening and one day in, you know, 2006, all of a sudden everybody on campus was watching YouTube. So do you think, oh, that's kind of interesting to think about that. YouTube did better than Google Video because YouTube, by the nature of being a scrappy startup, was able to like basically acquire a bunch of debt in the form of lawsuits because they were doing things like, you know, letting people upload all these illegal videos, primarily because they didn't have great technology to filter it out and, and really no means to. But also like that was the thing that sort of got their flywheel going. Yeah. And once it was in motion, they could do all sorts of things to... Um, sort of pay down that debt later on, but fundamentally they had the users and they had content flowing in. And yeah, I mean, I think it's um, it would be uh, I, I think it would be probably wrong and at least unclear to say that part of YouTube's strategy was to 
to illegally post content that they didn't have access to. I mean, this is what the whole lawsuit was about, and YouTube won the lawsuit. So, um, you know, legally, so we the can courts say unequivocally have decided, that, that yeah, unequ- you know, according to the courts. Um, but you know, I think it's unclear. And like, you know, we work with startups. You know, like things are you don't really have a good handle on what's going on in the early days, and people use your platform for what they use it for. But I think it does illustrate, you know, the scrappiness, the um, you know, the memorableness of YouTube, you know, and the idea that that could like plant in your brain as a concept of, you know, I mean, so many of these things I want to talk about when we get to tech themes, like streaming, that was not a concept that existed before YouTube, really. Yeah, uh, just talk to Justin Khan. No one wanted to watch. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the live streaming that we think of now, but even just streaming media, I mean, real networks was a thing, obviously, and we're here in Seattle, but like most uh, before YouTube, you know, and broadband penetration wasn't the you know basically a hundred percent that it is now like people downloaded content and watched videos that they had stored on their hard drives or listened to music or podcast you know podcasts originally were downloaded into <laughs> iTunes and right the idea that you would stream well, then, something yeah, live you used to put on your iPod with USB so you can listen to it <laughs> yeah exactly right I'm and sure that's what, what all why of are we our sitting listeners here now, are doing yeah, twelve years later and the medium is just barely taking off because yeah. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, I mean, think about it, like YouTube was really able to popularize this and then, and then the other piece of it I think is embeds, um, which I want to talk about in a minute. You know, I mean, YouTube could benefit from this amazing service that it offered that, that clearly millions and millions and now billions of people love, which is watching hosted video on the internet. Um, but you didn't have to go to youtube.com. You had to go to google.com slash videos to, discover and watch yeah, it's true and it was google videos yeah i remember thinking like well what videos would i have that i even it's it's like a naming thing in the, oh, oh man what videos would i have that i want to upload to google video i don't know but it like requires some weird creativity that i don't i don't yeah. didn't or but you have, have but a personal like YouTube, blog like, oh or... i know what this is like yep. you know it's videos of stuff that i do yep or, or or you have you know your own website about personal blog or or whatever and uh, you want to embed a video in there, yeah, you do that. And then, you know, if a user double clicks on it, they go to YouTube and then they learn about YouTube and they say, oh, you know, maybe I want to host my videos there. Or, wow, look at that Lazy Sunday sketch. Yeah. I have one more allegory that I want to make. I was thinking about um, sort of the debt you acquire in doing things that are like shady because later on it's going to be an untouchable flywheel that you're you know you've got so much cash that it doesn't matter and you can deal with it and there's actually two things that just came to mind one is linkedin just lost that lawsuit where the thing that they were doing that we all hate and that everybody notoriously rips on them for is like somehow they can never stop emailing me and they've been incredibly invasive in the inbox and they took all my contacts and they invited them all to linkedin for me and that was user hostile and illegal and they years and years and years later now finally got hit with the penalty that was like i don't know it was in the neighborhood of like a hundred million dollars and the value that they gained from that and the early days and all that lock-in is way more but you know the horse is way out of the barn like the race is over yeah i mean it's really interesting i mean i'm not uh i don't think either of us is saying we endorse either that we endorse this or that I think a lot of these tech companies like explicitly are thinking no, in this Machiavellian way, but, to do that. but think about, um, you know, think about Uber and Airbnb, right? Like Airbnb, one of the, they helped bootstrap their supply side network with posting to Craigslist, uh, was that, um, you know, that was against Craigslist terms of service, uh, was that, uh, you know, evil and Machiavellian of them? Like, I don't know. They probably didn't think about it that much. They were probably just trying to grow and not die and stop selling cereal. Right. Like, yeah, there's there's one more insanely good one that I heard recently. That's it's uh, quite a bit older. Microsoft apparently had this practice where they would sell you the rights to use MS DOS, but it didn't matter whether you actually put MS DOS on that computer or not. You were charged as a Microsoft customer for the number of CPUs that you shipped. Period. No matter if they had DOS on them or not, mm. and. That did an incredible thing because that you know the companies then are thinking like well uh, 
it doesn't matter if we put this on or not, we're going to get charged for it. So every PC leaving the door of the factory had MS-DOS on it. And then once Microsoft had the, an alleged monopoly on the entire computing industry, well, oh, then, then the Department of Justice comes back and says, well, that particular sales tactic is illegal. But again, years, I mean, in, years, in, years too late. In startups, when you're, you're trying to survive and grow, you know, if people say this, but this is it in practice. You know, unfair advantages, if you don't have one, somebody else does. And, you know, YouTube had an unfair advantage over Google Video. Yep. Okay. Um, I think we've kind of covered what would have happened otherwise. Like there was a massive problem (laughs) looming for YouTube. Someone else Um, would have picked them up or they would have gone gone bankrupt. Um, so yeah, tech themes. We've also covered a bunch of these, but, um, but you know, I, I pulled, I pulled three, I have a couple others, but, um, I pulled three out of the Sequoia memo that I thought, um, were, were that YouTube really illustrated that they identified, you know, one user generated content. You had this kind of, um, wave that started with blogging with blogger in the sort of early two thousands. Um, and then it moved into, uh, photos, you know, you had photo bucket, shutterfly, um, and MySpace, and then, and then early Facebook popping up of people starting to, you know, get this concept of sharing photos and then you had podcasting taking off and you had audio and um you know it was kind of you know sequoia loves these wave analogies but uh, they you can read the memo and it's just there in black and white you know video is the next and potentially biggest uh piece of this wave that's coming um so that's one uh two continued broadband adoption i mean this would not have been possible without broadband and and then three uh uh, the, the quote is wide proliferation of inexpensive video capture devices. Um, what was happening in 2005, 2006 was you had like flip yeah, cam, flip video, man, that went yeah. so well with Cisco. Yeah. And you had digital <laughs> cameras, still cameras shipping with video modes. Uh, and this was new. And then, and then shortly thereafter, cell phones happened, uh, smartphones happened. Yeah. I mean, you think about when this acquisition happened, was it like October of 2006? 2006? Yeah. I mean, not even a year before the iPhone. Yeah. Um, all of these things that all combine to, you know, in this, this, uh, um, you know, inferno to, to create the opportunity for YouTube. Yeah. And, and it's really interesting. I mean, I, I've been kind of ripping Google the whole time here and, um, will continue to, but the, they made a big bet that people would move from watching their televisions to watching video online. And we weren't calling it cord cutting then, and we didn't know that we'd have these Netflix-like subscriptions and things like that. But they were definitely making the bet that that video on the internet is the future of people's attention. And they were absolutely right about that. Yeah, I mean, I don't have cable. Do you have cable? Nope. Not in my adult life. Yep, me neither. Um, I uh, I think it's time for conclusion. Yeah. It's interesting. The The way that I sort of want to think about this is what else could Google have done if they wanted to capitalize on the trends we've been talking about, particularly the, the um, one that I was thinking of is, is uh, video on the internet is the place where people's attention will be. And as someone who, um, you know, as a company that captures value from being somewhere in the value chain of people's attention, of people's attention and where they spend their time, primarily in the form of seeking out information, it, you know, Google was making a defensive move that in the f- if that's how people are spending time in the future, then we need to be able to put advertising in front of them on that time during that time to monetize it. So what else could they have done? Netflix wasn't really a business yet that looked anything like this. That would have been sort of a silly acquisition. Um, they were trying with Google Video and clearly couldn't do it internally. And I, I, it feels like a rebooted effort there wouldn't have necessarily been as fruitful as this acquisition. I, I don't know that they had a lot of other ways to capitalize on this wave. Yeah, I like this. And uh, think about both then and today. What percentage of Google searches end in YouTube? I, I would imagine a pretty significant percentage. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty interesting. And if and if Google were 
sending, I don't know, I'm going to pick a number out of thin air, but uh, 10%, 15% of Google searches, I, I think that's seem feels reasonable to me end up in a youtube yeah. uh link and if they were if google were sending 10 to 15 percent of its traffic to a non-google property uh, i mean i guess it kind of does that with like amazon <laughs> um yeah yeah that's interesting is that bad for google's business if they're i guess it's bad if someone gets big enough so that they actually become a destination site where you go right to that home page instead of using google to search for it or facebook to discover it through what your friends and Facebook are surfacing to you, which are basically the two ways that people find things on the internet right now. Yeah. They're like, or they search on Amazon. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I even probably search products on Google that I know will come up on Amazon first. And I'm a, I freaking have an Amazon smile button in my bookmarks bar so that I always know to go there so that code.org gets the, the, the money. But it, I like always forget to do it because I end up just searching for the product in Google because I know Amazon's going to be the first thing anyway. So Google is my front door when I know what I want and Facebook is my front door when I don't know what That's I want. so big hearted of you don't and exist. such a fail. <laughs> I try. Um, what was the point I was going to make there? That is, okay, if it actually, let's go work off the hypothesis that a huge chunk of the traffic passing through Google goes to a single site instead of an aggregated bunch of little sites. That should be a problem because then in sort of a like Porter's Five Forces way, that business gets power over yep. Google and then people start going directly to that thing and they don't need like the retailer of Google anymore and they can just get their, their material directly from, um, directly from YouTube. YouTube has been owned by Google for 10 years and they still can't manage to make youtube.com slash a destination site. Like, I don't know that that actually would have been threatening to their business. Yeah. On the other hand, you could argue that, uh, Google really had no motivation to invest in doing so. Um, and had YouTube remained independent, which as we kind of established sort was of impossible. Yeah. Um, but let's imagine they could have, um, you know, would, uh, product oriented founders have led that company to, um, you know, something that looks like Twitch and what's going to happen to Twitch in the next 10 years. Yeah. That's super interesting too. So I'm going to render my conclusion. It's a C. Wow. Is that our lowest grade yet? Certainly mine. What did we give Siri? I don't remember. It's like a B minus. Yeah. Um, Okay, so for me, ah, uh, gosh, I kind of, part of me really wants to split this into two pieces, um, and so I think I'm going to do that and give a grade for each, but but we have to have just one grade, you know, so I'm going to ultimately yeah, render a final grade. 50% your show, you do what you want. Yeah, right, well, thanks, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate the trust here. Um, so I think as a... Um, I'm going to take first as a um, business, YouTube, um, unfortunately, I don't think has been a particularly good business. Um, as we've established, you know, we're 10 plus years into the company and revenues are great, but profits are basically zero. Um, and maybe there are things that, you know, they can invest in to change that over time or Google could have done differently, but um you know, a, a $5 billion revenue business with a $0 margin is not a great business, um, in my view. Fine, you start one. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I'm a VC. My job is to, is to judge other people's businesses, not to, you know, do the hard work <laughs> of actually building them. It's great. Um, so, you know, on the business side, I think this is a, oh, gosh, I don't know. C minus maybe. I mean, yeah, you're right. Like I can't build a $5 billion business. Like it's, it's freaking hard, but, um, and that 1.65 billion is just the beginning. I mean, think about the operational costs of oh, yeah. pouring more money into this business over the years and people and content investments and all that. Um, but I just don't, you know, it's not a great business by great business standards. Then I think the other lens I want to look at this through is, the product lens and this one's super interesting because like youtube is not a great product either like <laughs> it's really crappy in a lot of ways like as we've been discussing i mean maybe folks out there do but like ben and i don't go to youtube.com very often I mean, i probably do occasionally but only if i'm looking for a very very specific thing um and uh 
you know, and it's still kind of ugly, the site, and they've totally missed out on innovations like chat. And and I've, uh, I don't think I've ever opened the app directly. I've only ever been kicked into it. We even talk about mobile, but God. Yeah, right. You know, it took them forever to figure that out, and they're kind of like, okay, now. Um, but just on the, like, pure innovation side, I mean, uh, and I've talked about this already, the concept of streaming media, and yes, it existed with real networks and others before um, before YouTube, but really w- ex- working and working with video and working at scale, um, it changed the world, right? And then the second one being embeds, um, and embeds is a double edged sword because as we're talking, you know, as we've talked about, like, um, when you can embed your content on somebody else's, on other people's properties, like, why do they go to your property? But, um, as a concept, like, it's pretty amazing. It's awesome. As like a site owner, I don't have to like, host and and do figure out the codec and the delivery mechanism for all my own videos right That's and great. you did i mean it basically it it upgraded the internet youtube upgraded the internet yep. and like i an, don't think that's an exaggeration yeah it's an infrastructure layer that that didn't previously exist and then was just totally off the shelf oh yeah i'll just i'll just put my youtube video in that blog post yeah so and you know not, for these oh, not to mention to your first point when it like it, it changed the world and the there's a whole category of people that are YouTubers that are making a living doing that and a whole, yeah. you know, generation of people that know those people as their celebrities. Yeah. I mean, it like, I, this PewDiePie. is the like cheesiest thing, but it totally, totally democratized video creation and yes. becoming a star. Yeah. And, um, you know, so, and for that reason, I think this product side is like really hard. Like they, it's been really disappointing and a big failure on several product fronts however on like the core things that like it is just knocked it out of the park so um i give it an a minus on the product side overall i'm gonna mash this up into a b for google um because i think you know i could be wrong but i think if you asked larry and sergey and eric if they could go back to 2006 and would they spend 1.65 billion dollars for youtube i think they would do that all day every day yeah, I mean, also, like, just on their personalities, right? Like, it's, I'm not going to call it a moonshot, but it, it sort of falls in the vein of, like, what if anybody could make movies and then anybody in the world could watch them? And, like, it, this idea was not as fathomable in 2002 and obvious as it is today, right? Like, the world a couple of years before YouTube compared to the world now, it sort of does look like a crazy moonshot. And if they can do that and it doesn't at least cost money to run... It's a good thing. There we are. Cool. Thanks for joining us. See, See you next, next time. time. Who got the truth? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Who got the truth now? Huh. All right, listeners, we have a longtime favorite acquired company to tell you about Modern Treasury. Modern Treasury is the software platform that turns money movement operations into code. Yeah, for years now, services like Stripe, Adyen, and Square have enabled developers to accept credit card payments in apps. But that's only the tip of the iceberg of what a business needs to fully handle the movement of money in and out of their company. Those payment actions from Stripe and Adyen, etc., flowed through to ledger systems and then reconciliations, compliance verifications, and that's before any cash actually moves between institutions, which of course involves banking operations. Yes, their APIs of course work with Plaid, Stripe, Intuit, etc., but also with their incredible banking partner network with over 30 banks, meaning that for the first time, you literally can turn your banking operations at any of those institutions into software. This means faster payments, easy adoptions of new payment rails when they come out, like FedNow. It means automatic reconciliation and real-time financial data. This lets you move money at the speed of software, which, as we now know, after the first half of 2023, being able to move money fast is very important. Yes, we love Modern Treasury so much. The founders and really the whole team have become close friends of Ben and mine really back to when they first got started. And this is a very cool full circle moment that just happened. We just emceed their first big conference here in San Francisco, Transfer, which happened at the beginning of June. Yes, if your business involves money movement, be it a marketplace, fintech platform, real estate, lending, investing, or anyone who reconciles or moves money, go on over to moderntreasury.com slash acquired and make sure that when you get in touch, you tell them that Ben and David sent you. 
All right, listeners, our sponsor is one of our favorite companies, Vanta, and we have something very new from them to share. Of course, you know Vanta enables companies to generate more revenue by getting their compliance certifications. That's SOC 2, ISO 27001. But the thing that we want to share now is Vanta has grown to become the best security compliance platform as you hit hypergrowth and scale into a larger enterprise. It's kind of wild. When we first started working with Vanta and met Christina, my gosh, I mean, they had like a couple hundred customers, maybe. Now they've got 5,000, some of the largest companies out there. It's awesome. Yeah, and they offer a tremendous amount of customization now for more complex security needs. So if you're a larger company and in the past you showed Vanta to your compliance department, you might have heard something like, oh, well, we've already got a compliance process in place and we can't integrate this new thing. But now, even if you already have a SOC 2, Vanta makes maintaining your compliance even more efficient and robust. They launched Vendor Risk Management. This allows your company to quickly understand the security posture of the vendors that you're choosing in a standardized way that cuts down on security review times. This is great. And then on the customization front, they now also enable custom frameworks built around your controls and policies. Of course, that's in addition to the fact that with Vanta, you don't just become compliant once, you stay compliant with real-time data pulled from all of your systems, now all of your partners' systems, and you get a trust report page to prove it to your customers. If you click the link in the show notes here or go to vanta.com slash acquired, you can get a free trial. And if you decide you love it, you will also get $1,000 off when you become a paying customer make sure you go to vanta.com slash acquired. Four score and seven years ago. Our forefathers brought forth in this continent. How far can you go with that? I actually forgot. The... That's as far as you got? Oh, you didn't even get that far? What did you learn in civics in elementary school? Who got the truth? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Who got the truth now? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Sit me down. Say it straight. Another story on the way. Who got the truth? Welcome to episode number eight of Acquired. I'm Ben Gilbert. I'm David Rosenthal. And we are your hosts. Today we have a very special episode. We have uh, a guest at Microsoft, uh, Kurt Del Benny. Yeah, we are very lucky to have Kurt Del Benny with us today. Uh, he's been a great friend and mentor to uh, both of us in different ways, uh, and actually both of us at Madrona too. Um, so Kurt uh, started his career actually at the very uh, famous and renowned Bell Labs um, and spent five years there and then went to uh, Booth and got his MBA um, at Chicago, uh, went to did a short stint at McKinsey after that and then went to Microsoft and had an over 20 year career at Microsoft that um, culminated when Ben was there in, um, in Kurt being the president of Office. Uh, which he was until December 2013. And, uh, and then afterwards, he went to, uh, to healthcare.gov and did a stint there helping launch Obamacare. And after that, ended up uh, with us for a little while. We were really lucky to have him at Madrona as a venture partner. And, uh, and then last spring, uh, Kurt returned to Microsoft and uh, is the EVP of corporate strategy and planning. So thank you, Kurt, for uh, gracing us. Hey, it's good to be here and good to talk to you guys again. Just one little correction on healthcare.gov. I came in after the launch to help them repair it. You did. And and, and for, for listeners, I had the privilege of uh, waking up real early one morning and, and coming in to hear um, Kurt talk about that at Madrona. It is absolutely fascinating to hear how to mop up a gigantic <laughs> software project like that and, and getting all the right people on the bus, all the right um, consultants and contracting firms that that are putting that whole thing together. It is a crit that that looked like an absolute ballet. Well, it's it was uh, super rewarding and super challenging. So maybe we can do a future podcast just on that. It's a good. It's an interesting topic. You needed to uh, you needed to get some good R and R. So you went to a venture firm for yeah uh, ten exactly. months afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, so today with Kurt, um, we're going to talk about. Uh, hopefully a very topical um, acquisition. And we're actually going to lump a few in here, but the main focus is going to be Accompli, which is now um, the mobile outlook on iOS and Android. Um, so I'm going to run through quickly. Uh, we're going to do Accompli and then, and then we'll sprinkle in little bits of uh, both Sunrise and Wonderlist, which are also 
um, office productivity apps that Microsoft all acquired in the past 18 months or so. Um, and, uh, and so I'm going to run through quickly the acquisition history and facts. Accompli founded April 2013 by Javier Sotero, Soltero, uh, JJ Zhuang, and Kevin Henriksen. Um, it's interesting, Javier was CMU engineer and then an early employee at Netscape. And Javier uh, spent three and a half years at, at VMware before kind of coming back to his uh, productivity roots and founding Accompli, which um, I was a, a user from, from day one when it launched in, launched in beta and thought it was on my iPhone and thought it was just a great, um, you know, really the first mobile app that combined mail and calendar all in one app um the 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 magic that outlook had been doing for so many years and no one (laughs) no one really innovation ios um what's what's uh old is new again um (laughs) they raised uh, a 7.3 million dollar series a from redpoint um led by redpoint uh where javier had been in in eir after vmware um uh and harrison metal and felicis uh and then about 18 months later, uh, Microsoft acquired the company in December 2014 for a reported $200 million. Um, it was interesting. There's actually a, everybody knew this acquisition was going to happen because Microsoft wrote a blog post about it and it leaked about two weeks before the acquisition yeah. actually, uh, actually went live. Yeah. Not a shining moment. Not a shining moment, but, uh, but, um, it was successful. The acquisition happened. There were about 25 employees, all based in San Francisco. They all joined Microsoft. Um, and, and l- David, that was only, I think, like seven, eight months after launch, nine months, maybe. I think it launched in April of that yep. same year. It was it was 18 months, less than 18 months after the founding of the company. Um, and uh, uh, so it was very quick. And this was right after um, uh, Dropbox had acquired Mailbox. Uh, so it was the era of email, mobile email acquisitions. Begun the iOS mail app wars have. Yes. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, Microsoft uh, then acquired the calendar app Sunrise in February 2015. Um, and then in June of 2015, Microsoft acquired Wonderlist, the to-do list app, which I know um, has a, probably has a soft spot in Kurt's heart knowing how much he loves lists. Um, I do love Wonderlist. It is a great app. I, I joked when that happened, I think with Kurt, that uh, Microsoft was trying to buy my entire iPhone home screen. <laughs> uh, exactly. So what you'll have to tell us at the end what you're using these days. I am still using all of these products. <laughs> uh, that, that's, a, that's an endorsement right there. Yeah. There you go. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. So um, with that, you know, what's happened since then? Um, in Jul- At that same time, uh, right after uh, the Wonderlist acquisition, uh, Javier was actually promoted um, uh, within Microsoft to be the corporate VP running all of Outlook. So not uh, not just the Outlook mobile app, but Outlook on desktop as well. Um, shortly thereafter, after that, um, Sunrise uh, Calendar was rolled into Outlook. Um, Wonderlist has, has remained independent um, today, but uh, has been announced that... Um, further integrations may be coming on that front. So maybe Kurt can enlighten us on that. Um, but with that, uh, uh, Kurt would love to hear kind of how you thought about, uh, about all of these products. Sure. So the first thing I should say is the acquisition happened during my uh, time away from Microsoft, but I know the whole history of it. The corporate strategy team was, which I lead now was intimately involved in the, in the acquisition. So, and I obviously know the space super well. I've spent uh, a ton of time in office. So when I saw it happen, I said, okay, this one makes complete sense. Um, this is an example. I mean, there are different reasons that Microsoft makes acquisitions as I'm sure there are for all companies. There are places where we look at our position in a particular area and say, we need a technology, we need a particular product. There are other cases where we opportunistically look at uh, a, a product or company that's doing well in a space and said, wow, we can see a, an adjacency to the business that we have. And so we want to um, uh, we want to acquire the company to kind of build up, build out that adjacency. There's some more rare cases where we'll do it to get a particular set of talent. You know, we see a team that's super, super good. Um, but th- I think that tends to be the exception. 
This one was the was kind of, I would say, a strategic acquisition. If you think about the journey that Office has been on, uh, the core competency has been on the desktop, uh, uh, you know, the Office suite. And I, by desktop, I mean both the Windows PC and, um, you know, kind of leading productivity on the Mac as well. And so coming from that core, as other uh, OSs became popular, particularly in the mobile space, um, uh, the team actually it was a corporate strategy effort with the team, with the ASG team as well. We said, OK, this is clearly a place where we've got to, to make an acquisition or build ourselves. But we need to have um, a, a great app for the core Office 365 scenarios. And those are mm -hmm. email contacts, uh, calendaring and to do. And so we said, do we want to make or do we want to buy? And is there somebody out there that we would love to have? And uh, really just said, OK, what would if we do want to acquire, what would that look like? What would it look like to make it internally? Um, and are there candidates there that would would be great for us to acquire? So that's what kind of got us started on the path. Um, and it kind of went from there. Cool. Thanks, Kurt. I, I think it's uh, one of the things that you read a lot about these days is Microsoft shifting from the Windows and Office company to a, a mobile first cloud first company. Mm -hmm. And yep. You know, I, I think that from a high level, first of all, as a, as a consumer and, and just, you know, from the public perception of Microsoft these days, everyone is loving that. I mean, the whole focus on build a really great cross-platform experience, have your the same data with you everywhere, access to the same services, um, you know, the same core yeah. office services that you know and love, huge value prop for consumers. As you guys transition to, um, you know, these free mobile apps that are on platforms that you don't own, um, how do you look at that as sort of um, the the revenue future of Microsoft, and how does that replace the the giants of yore with selling Windows and, and Office Box software? The giants of yore, I love that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think there's a couple ways to look at it. Uh, the first thing is you have to recognize that Office 365, the cloud versions of Exchange, SharePoint, and Skype for Business are strong in rapidly growing revenue streams for Microsoft in you know by themselves so in some sense it's always been the case that when you buy exchange you get a client experience um, that goes with that you know go all the way back to the exchange clients in uh, the mid 90s there's always a client that came with it and that model has stayed and so again looking at a company in particular they were really developing a very fast leadership position in terms of downloads, in terms of monthly active users, uh, that was very appealing to us. And so uh, I think um, just that's a natural of, to, some, when it comes to mobile, you've got to, to have a certain free experience. And then you can think about having a paid experience incremental to what the expectation in the market of what is free. So in the case of email, you know, the expectation is you're going to have a single client that will work against your free mail, but will also work against your enterprise mail. You can mm -hmm. think about features that you put behind a firewall, you know, a pay firewall. We do that by having uh, certain tiers within Office 365. And then there's certain tiers within the client, too, which is also available as a subscription. So we think about there's a certain free thing that free piece that you want to give to everybody. There's a certain set of features that can be made available as add-ons. Um, there are particular areas where that works well. So uh, features where to communicate to somebody else, you got to have the paid one. That doesn't work very well because you want to have a common capability across the across all the people using the service. But things like enterprise features, like uh, um, retention policies mm -hmm. and uh, anything around usage analysis, et cetera. Those are all features where people will pay for pay extra for them, but you don't have to build it into the core product. So we definitely see the ability to kind of tier things that way. The other thing you have to think about is uh, people have multiple devices. You, you, you know, they have a PC, they have an Android phone, they have a Windows phone, they have a, a Mac and an iPhone. And so you have to think about the client experience as being a single set of client experiences that go across all those different devices. And if you can package those together into a subscription, then you can sell the value proposition of the entire subscription, regardless of what uh, device you happen to, to have. But then again, you still have to think about, we need to have a leader pos leadership position in all of the devices that people find popular. 
And mm -hmm. so we want to have Office be the best experience, regardless of whether you're on an iOS device, whether you're on an Android device. You know, we'd love to, to have you think of Windows as your home, but we need to have a great experience regardless of the devices that you use. Well, I think, um, you know, this is something that uh, Microsoft and, and you have really done a great job with. I mean, even going back to the origin of Office 365, um, you know, Ben, when you were working at Microsoft, you were working on uh, Office for iPad, right? It was. That was, that was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we finally, we did get around to shipping that. Then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, yes. Um, you know, the importance of it, you know, as a consumer, um, you know, it's not about my experience with my mail client or with Excel or with Word on a, on a particular device. Now it's about how that works in concert across all of the areas where I'm doing my computing. Um, a, a related area that I'm curious if you guys thought about with the Accompli acquisition and the strategy is um, something that Ben touched on, the unified inbox. I and mean, I mm -hmm. remember in my first job uh, in finance out of college, um, I had obviously Outlook. I was working in a bank uh, and all of my work email was on Outlook on my computer and my workstation. Um, and uh, the iPhone had just launched and I loved it because it meant I could get my Gmail at work. Uh, and, and now... Um, you know, the concept of having different inboxes, uh, for me at least, is something I think for probably most of our listeners is um, something that we, we wouldn't even think about anymore. Was that, um, totally. was that part of the strategy here too? Yeah, I think that Accompli does a great job of giving you a single unified inbox. The Windows Phone also on its client also can get, you can link together a couple inboxes together. But if you go all the way back to when Outlook was first created, um, it uh, was a total different look at what had historically been separate products for email versus calendaring. Mm -hmm. You know, we had Schedule Plus. Those of you older in your yeah. your uh, blogosphere listeners will remember Schedule Plus. It, it became a verb. It was so popular, and in fact, um, still still echoes around the hallways of Microsoft about sending us pluses around. Exactly. Every time I correct them and I, I call it a meet, it's a meeting request because <laughs> you know, schedule pl plus is long since dead. But this notion that things come together and become unified, it really just follows how people expect to use the product. So when you start building a bunch of meeting request capability into schedule plus, all of a sudden it starts to look a lot like email. And so Outlook uh, and under Brian McDonald, who is the, the kind of the father of, of Outlook way back when it was called Wren, as in Wren and Stimpy. He had this idea that you want to bring these different mail and calendaring um, and tasks all together into a single user experience, which clearly has been borne out. Um, early on, the versions of Outlook were not up to the task, really, I will say in retrospect. That there was a period of time when Outlook was called Lookout because you wanted to stay away from it because it was pretty slow um, when it first happened, but it's become really the leader in this integrated set of products. And, and I think that's happening on mobile devices as well, because those scenarios are so deeply integrated together. Um, I think you find calendaring deeply integrated. That's why Sunrise got integrated into Compli. Task management actually is a little bit different. And so we think that there's, you know, if anything, the mobile uh, the paradigm on mobile is different applications for different use cases. And so it's not necessarily the case that what you do for the PC is what makes sense to do on a mobile device as well. And I can tell you there aren't any particular plans to take Wonderlist and, and, and deeply integrate it with Accompli. Where the scenarios cross over probably makes a lot of sense. But then, you know, the personality needs to be preserved of those different applications. Um, and we think they're big applications in and of, of themselves. Yeah, and it, it's a, a great lead into, um, you know, we're talking about integration of software right now. Let's talk about integration of people. Mm -hmm. How, what were the different options you guys looked at for how you could integrate the teams in terms of location, in terms of hierarchy, um, in terms of, you know, focusing on retention? And what decisions did you guys make um, with primarily the Accompli team? It's a really, it's a great question. Um, that it is super, super important for us to retain the both the particular talent, the fact that they're a team as well, 
um, but also the personality of the of the organization itself. So it is not this uh, this get integrated into the collective and you are just part of Microsoft. We work really, really hard um, to keep the teams separate while we take the opportunity of being part of Microsoft to be an accelerant to the objectives of the of the team. And so a lot mm -hmm. of folks, uh, these teams come on and they're just super excited about being able to leverage the, the breadth of Microsoft to do more great things. And, and so unless... Um Unless I'm mistaken, all of these teams are uh, still in their original locations. Well, that's um, the other thing. None of them are in Redmond, right? Right. It doesn't make much sense to have everybody come uh, to Redmond. It's it's not necessary. We are already a broad um, company that has locations everywhere, and so there's not a need from that perspective. And you know, there's no purpose in them moving. They have cool locations. They have homes where their family are. And so in most cases, we actually don't relocate them. Um, and that's definitely been the case here as well. The Wonderless guys are in Germany and they love being there and we're just as happy to have them there as well. I mean, the nature of software is it is a global business now. And so we can definitely accommodate that. The other thing that we've tried to really do is figure out how do we take advantage of that the uh, skills that the team has and the vision that they have. That's why you see Javier become the leader of uh, Outlook overall. And that's just a recognition that, hey, these guys did something really incredible. And we want to make sure that we take advantage of that as much as humanly possible. And so that's a, we definitely look for cases like that as well. I mean, the third thing I would say is the trickiest aspect of it from our perspective is we have um, places where we want to drive synergy between uh, their product and other products at Microsoft. And that's a very, very tricky piece because these guys all come in um, with an, a set of plans that they have in place that they want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And if you divert them too far from that mission, you can ruin the, what's special that you, you did the acquisition for in the first place. And so we try to be really, really careful. I'm not sure we always get the balance right. There's sometimes when we over index on the integration and we find that we lose a little of the secret sauce because the product starts coming out more slowly and the innovation doesn't come through as well. And we're learning all the time too. And so um, I'm not sure we always get it right. I actually think on these acquisitions that we're talking about, we, we set the balance pretty well. Yeah, and I can I can speak to that. I, I just um, put out a tweet a couple of days ago, sort of asking about who's using um, Outlook for iPhone, and I got a response from uh, someone I, I knew on the team over there, and it, you know, the, his response was something along the lines of, um, "Let me know how you like it. We move fast, yep. and I want feedback." Yeah. And it seems like that team, and I, I I'm not certain, but I think he was at Microsoft pre-acquisition, so it seems like some of that DNA sort of bleeds into the existing team and, and kind of lights a fire. Yeah, even simple things like if you if you use Outlook for um, for iPhone, there's a way actually for either um, platform, you can give user feedback on the product directly from within the product from the context that you're you're in, and it'll bundle up everything that it knows about what you're trying to do and basically send it directly to us. And so that's a place where you know we'd love to take those learnings of how. They got that that 360 feedback loop and really, really intensely follow it and collect the data. So as as your friend said, they move they can move super, super fast. Yeah. And from a leadership perspective, I mean, when you have people that have made their whole career and their their life's work outlook, and then you do an acquisition like this and and the leadership of of the broader outlook becomes someone from this new and outside team, you know, how do you how do you make sure that lands organizationally? Well, it actually, it's not as hard as you might think. The Probably the biggest challenge is if you've got particular people who were in line for that job or a job in specific, it's, you know, I think it's a misconception that people at Microsoft are, are not, um, you know, are not open or embracing of, of new things that come in. I'm not actually even sure if it's a misconception. It's definitely not the case. And so when a new team like come, this comes in, and, and in Compli in particular, or any of these products, Sunrise, Wonderlist, it's like it, 
the overall view is, oh my gosh, this is a fantastic thing. Let's, in, let's bring them in. Let's embrace them as a team. Let's learn from them and we'll all do great things together. So it's not as hard as you might think. Um, yeah, absent the particular, real... particular positions where somebody from the entering team might get a, uh, get, get a position that somebody else might have thought they were in line for. Hmm. When, um, I, I mean, I, I remember when Javier was, uh, promoted to, to corporate VP and hearing, um, you know, hearing about it in the press, but then also hearing friends at Microsoft talk about it, you know, so often, you know, you see, you know, we see looking at lots of acquisitions, the, CEO or the management team of the target company will end up, you know, with some meaningless VP title yep. at, at the acquiry and they'll stay for 18 months until they vest and then they're gone and on to their next thing. I mean, this is a major, major role at Microsoft um, and really was, you know, I don't know if promotion is the right word, given that he was CEO of a company, but, but a real recognition of a, a scope um, that, uh, that, that really was, was much broader than, than just the Accompli mobile app. Absolutely. And it was, it truly was a recognition that he has skills that we want to leverage more broadly than just within the Accompli team per se. And it's working out really, really well. Actually, I was going to bring this up later, but, um, you know, Javier wrote in uh, the blog post announcing <laughs> the acquisition, um, yeah, he he wrote the he wrote these these sentences here that are, that I'll read. He said, "18 months ago, we started building a team and a product around the idea that we could make mobile email better. Today, that journey continues as part of a larger organization with the technology, talent, and market reach that will help us take the the vision of Accompli to hundreds of millions of mobile users across the world." And I just thought when I read that, as we were researching this episode, you see some version of that in every acquisition that gets announced. Mm -hmm. you know, oh yeah, we you know we're going to get the scale and the resources that are really going to enable us to impact many more users. Um, and usually it's pretty hollow, uh, but but here, um, you know, I, I, kudos to you and, and to Microsoft for really. Um, giving a giving them that in truth but uh but it's really rare to see the team embrace this as much as as um as javier and the accompli team have yeah no i i appreciate that and it really was the intention you know that there is a bit of a scale difference too though because there are a billion users of office across the planet and so if you were somebody who wanted to see your vision get delivered just think about it just in the context of business users that say hey, I'm running Office, and now Microsoft says we have a great Outlook client for iPhone and for Android. You're basically just sanctioning that product as being the product that they should use. Now, the great thing about Accompli is it had a huge user base in, or quickly growing user base um, from a strong core. And so we were both able to take advantage of that in terms of getting a, a stronger footprint in mobile right there. But there, you know, Javier was right in terms of the leverage that came uh, from just announcing it and starting to um, distribute it with Office, et cetera. It, 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 we gave them a big boost and we took advantage of the boost that they gave us as what, well. I'm curious, as you were, when you made the acquisition, did Javier's background from Netscape and then from VMware especially, um, did that play into it? Did you... Um, uh, did did you Microsoft see him as a potential leader when you when you bought the company and was that a factor? Well, we definitely look at the talent, the specific talent, as part of our due diligence process. I would not say that we. There are times when we actually do look for talent as the as I discussed earlier, talent as the primary reason for doing an acquisition. The primary reason for this acquisition was they had a great product in a in a space that we thought was super complementary to us. And so, you know, that's the reason to do it there. But we definitely look at the talent um, and figure out how do we retain those key people along the way. Um, the other thing that I would say is there's this whole question that often comes up, at least at Microsoft, and I'm sure elsewhere, is there are times when you think you can buy the second best or the third best person <laughs> or mm -hmm. uh, product or company. And there are times when you know you just need to buy the best. 
And this is a case, uh, all three of those are the case where we wanted to buy the leader in the space. And in that sense, if that's your first and foremost uh, goal and you believe you got a great team, then the acquisition kind of writes itself. It's, it just makes a ton of sense and it, and it works out super well. And that's what kind of what happened in this case. I, I want to push on that a little bit. Yeah. Why is it so important to have the absolute best clients, um, Wonderlist and Outlook, uh, Outlook for iPhone and, um, and Sunrise? I guess that'll eventually just be an Outlook. When those are, are free products that can access both Microsoft services and other services, and the money is made on Office 365 subscriptions, which can also be accessed by a variety of clients? That's a good question. I, I think above all, we now live in a world where individual pull of applications is, in particular categories like email, is incredibly important and in some ways more important than the push that can happen from Microsoft saying this is our solution for email. And so that's a big piece of it. So when you we yeah. you see that's this, a big mindset. Shift. Yeah, it is. It is. It's not, you know, it, there are places where we think we can, quote unquote, make the market by uh, driving innovation, you know, defining innovation, delivering on it and making a category. I think SharePoint was probably an example of that. And there are other places where other people are establishing what that category looks like, particularly on um, form factors like mobile. And you just recognize it and say, you know, this is a place where we we just want to get the best. Um, the other thing is you always want to give yourself every advantage to do well. And in that case, if you're also having to overcome the fact that there's a leader in front of you that's got incredible end user pull, you know, it's it's just not worth settling for that second best app. It's true. And if you're in, if you're kind of following in the footsteps there. I mean, the client app is really the front door to the consumer experience. So I guess there's always that risk that 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 client app could start prioritizing a different service. I mean, you, you don't own that customer relationship at that point unless you're you're the leader with the the client interface. Yeah, I think that's a different kind of acquisition, which isn't unheard of. There there are sometimes when you can acquire an application, and I don't think we ever do it. I can't think of a case where we have ever acquired anything purely for the sake of getting it out of the hands of a competitor, or <laughs> keeping it from being, being independent. It is a kind of nice byproduct in some cases where, you know, we think there's a good reason to have this application. And by the way, we'd rather the other guy didn't have it. But I don't think, I can't think of a single time when that has been um, a predominant reason. Uh, it's kind of a nice, uh, a bonus, if you will. It's it's really interesting um, that you say that. The, the last episode we did uh, was on YouTube. Yeah. And one of the really cool things about YouTube is there's all of this publicly available information about um, about the company and about the acquisition because of the lawsuit, the Viacom and, and YouTube and then ultimately Google lawsuit. Um, and uh, it's interesting. Eric Schmidt testified that one of the key reasons both both for the acquisition and for the price they paid for YouTube was a, the opposite of what you're saying was to keep it out of other people's hands. Really? Did you yeah. say whose hands they wanted to keep it out of? Uh, he, I don't believe he named specific uh, competitors, but uh, implied that they were other very large technology companies. <laughs> I, I, I stand by, I can't think of an acquisition that we've done for that reason. You know, at the heart of it, the other thing I would say is, you know, Microsoft is a, we are a product and a technology driven company. And what we're trying to do within each of the product groups is what is the, you know, the, the dominant meme, if you will, about the discussions that we have. It's like if you own the office business or you're part of the team, you're always thinking about your own product and how do you make it stronger? How do you make it better? You're not thinking about how you use it as a chess move, how you would make an acquisition to be a chess move to keep something out of somebody else's reach. I don't know, Ben, you were there. Can you imagine? Have you? Do you remember ever having such an acquisition? No, not while I was there. Yeah. And I can't imagine too, like the just thinking about the rest of the uh, Office for iPad team. Like, if we had bought one of the weird kind of like Office clones for iPad that we were looking at as sort of like the not doing so well but decent competitive yeah. landscape, and like tried to bring them into the team, that that would have been really messed up. Yep. You know, the other thing about it is it's there's a certain amount of risk in an acquisition period. And so everything you want, everything going for you. 
because there's always going to be things that that help mess it up when you when you bring it in. So, um, you know, having some ulterior motive, which is pull it out of somebody's hands versus being led by what you want to proactively and positively do with the product. It just doesn't seem like a very good calculus to me. But eh, maybe that's what Eric uh, really had in mind when he bought YouTube. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it seemed to work out for him pretty well. So, they, they, I don't well, know, we graded they, that one not <laughs> super highly. Is that but. right? Yeah, we, we gave it a C, or at least I did. Wow, you guys are tough graders. YouTube, yeah. 10 years later, is a break even business. They've lost a lot of money on that business. Well, I guess that is true. And, huh. Is it break even on an annual basis, including advertisements? Uh, as far as our research could determine, yes. Interesting. I don't follow that space super closely, so there are a lot of uh, a lot of cogs in that business. I suppose that's uh, true, both on the technology and on the content and uh, talent side. Yeah. Um, this is a great time to tell you about one of our very favorite companies, Crusoe. So. Crusoe, as listeners know by now, is a clean compute cloud provider specifically built for AI workloads. NVIDIA is one of their major partners, and literally Crusoe's data centers are nothing but racks and racks of A100s and H100s. And because Crusoe's cloud is purpose-built for AI and run on wasted, stranded, or clean energy, they can provide significantly better performance per dollar than traditional cloud providers. Yes, we talked about that on our ACQ2 episode with Crusoe CEO Chase Lockmiller. The other element that makes Crusoe special is the environmental angle. Crusoe, of course, locates their data centers at stranded energy sites. So think oil flares, wind farms that can't use all the energy they generate, etc., and uses that power that would otherwise be wasted to run your AI workloads instead. Yep. Obviously, it's a huge benefit for the environment and for customers on costs since Crusoe doesn't rely on the energy grid. Energy is the second largest cost of running AI after, of course, the price you pay NVIDIA for the chips. And these lower energy costs get passed on to customers. It's super cool that they can put their data centers out there in these remote locations where, quote unquote, energy happens, as opposed to the other hyperscalers such as AWS and Google and Azure who need to build their data centers close to major traffic hubs where the internet happens because they are doing everything in their clouds. Yep. If you, your company, or your portfolio companies would like to use the lower cost and more performant infrastructure for your AI workloads, go to crusocloud.com slash acquired. That's C-R-U-S-O-E cloud.com slash acquired or click the link in the show notes. Let's move on. Um, two uh we're gonna do uh two other um uh categories that we like to do on the show or, or segments um first is uh ben and i both and, and kurt you're welcome to join in too we assign a category to each acquisition we're looking at and um the uh the categories we typically use are people technology product and business line and we give ourselves an out of an other <laughs> um but uh Ben, you want to go ahead? Yeah, absolutely. This is a product acquisition. Um, there's n nice things that came along with it, but um, OWA, the Outlook Web access, a access app, was just not good. And as someone that was at Microsoft and using it for quite a while, I was getting a lot of uh, encrypted mail in, in IRM. And so I had um, that, that old uh, Outlook Web Access installed on my phone just to read the encrypted mail. And then I'd get out of there as fast as I could. And I'm like rooting for the home I'm team, sorry right? For you. I'm, I'm trying so hard. And it was, you know, it, it, it was a shame seeing all these other really great mail clients out there. Um, and this is right when Mailbox and Accompli were popping up and, um, you know, useless for a lot of my mail. Yeah. So it, it, I remember it, even just as an exchange user at Madrona, I mean, it was it was uh, really frustrating because all my friends who were working at startups, you know, were using Mailbox or uh, the Gmail app and, um, and they were great. And, and look, like it, it came not a moment too soon. I think that um, for me, it, the Accompli, I was using it before the acquisition. I was using it after the acquisition. Um, I thought it was super impressive, the turnaround time from from going from um, being a acquisition where they were trying to work out exactly you know what it was going to turn into and what the timelines were going to look like and what the people were going to look like. You can kind of like, it, you always figure all oh, that'll take like six months or so. Within two months, it shipped as Outlook for iPhone. And like all the news stories were kind of funny that, oh, they just slapped a new label on it. Maybe they did, but who cares? It was great. That's a really good point. Uh, at some at some point, you don't want to mess with success. And there's a certain <laughs> yeah. set of legal things you got to do to make it a Microsoft product. But that's and that's probably what took the time. But, you know, keep giving people what they love. 
Yeah. So I'll go next. And uh, I'm curious, uh, Ben and, and particularly Kurt may, uh, may beat me up for this one, but um, I'm going to go out of the box on this one. I'm going to call it an other. Um, and, uh, and I wrote down um, combo meal. Uh, because I, <laughs> not only because it was multiple acquisitions, uh, if you include Sunrise and, and Wonderlist, um, but I actually think there are elements of this that, as there are in every acquisition, but here that, that really hit on every, um, every category. We've talked about a lot of them already. Um, I, I would say the reason for this is it was really, um, a revitalization of a business line, not a creation of a new one, but a rethinking of, um, of an entire business line in this case being outlook as part of the broader office, um, uh, future on, on a, in a mobile first cloud first world. And, um, you know, part of that is technology. Um, and part of that big part of that is people as we've talked about, um, and product as well. Um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go with combo meal. I think there's something to that. I mean, there is, there's clearly, I would say it's predominantly a product acquisition because that was, we, we had in mind something very specific we wanted to acquire, but there's clearly synergies with the other parts of the office business and so in, in office products. So think about the fact when you download a piece of email, it has an attachment, you want to fire up Word to read that attachment. There's a way of, of kind of linking those scenarios together that kind of goes towards your your combo meal theory, but it also said you, you need to establish a footprint on mobile devices and the first workload, if you will, that, that people use, or the first three, I would say, are the three that we, we acquired in these three acquisitions. And so in that sense as well, it was in uh, re-energizing the businesses also. So I guess I would, I think there's something to that. It's a, it's a, maybe it's a combo meal, um, that has at its heart a, uh, a product deal. Um, maybe we call that a happy meal. <laughs> that is interesting. You mean, you, t- you talk about the, the key scenarios on mobile there. It's like, uh, you know, now office is a full productivity suite and a mobile lightweight productivity suite. Yep. And those are dramatically different yeah. applications. Well, I love the framing too, that you have heard of, of workloads and what's your mobile workload. And, um, I, I think the Office mobile apps, uh, Word and PowerPoint and Excel are great, but I almost never use them. Um, my mobile workload is email, calendar, to do. Yep. Uh, no, I think that's right. I, the the usage we find that the applications are primarily used for great viewing, which the fidelity of of viewing in in our applications is better than others, um, and then light editing, which means you know, there are scenarios like imagine if you're you're read, uh, reading a document in Word and there's a set of comments that or edit revisions that you've got to um, take a look at and react to and edit with others that are working on the document. It's those kinds of scenarios for which you would use Word, Excel and PowerPoint. PowerPoint, you know, presenting PowerPoint presentation mode really works really well. But you have to rethink the scenarios. It's not just that you imagine um, using doing the same things on a mobile device that you do on your desktop. They're just different. Um, let's move on to. I want to make sure we have enough time for uh, my favorite part of the show, which is our um, our our technology themes segment. And uh, and Kurt, so what we do here is uh, each of us talks about. And, and again, you please join in. Would love to get your thoughts. You know, kind of what does this acquisition or these acquisitions highlight for you in terms of the the eternal truths about our business and, and technology. And, and Ben and I usually take a startup bent on this, but it'll be, um, I'm curious on your take, you know, having been at a big tech company for so long, having done a stint with us, you know, in the venture world, um, uh, what, uh, what themes are. So maybe, maybe Ben and I will go first, give you a little time to think about it. Um, but, you know, for me, I'll, I'll go because uh, this will be quick. We've, we've really already touched on it. But um, one big theme that all of these acquisitions highlight for me is, is I think, Kurt, I think you said it, you know, innovation is distributed. It's global today. Um, you know, uh, Accompli is in San Francisco. Sunrise was in New York City. Wonderlist is in Berlin. Um, we haven't talked about it yet, but uh, and it's not 
in the same group, but Microsoft also recently acquired SwiftKey, mm-hmm. um, another part of your strategy to take over my iPhone. Um, <laughs> but uh, they're in London, and and uh, again, don't know about SwiftKey, but the plan with with all of the previous acquisitions is keep these teams where they are. And I think in a world of, you know, in the a consequence of this mobile first, cloud first world is, you know, with GitHub, with Slack, with Dropbox, with AWS. And yes, with, you know, Office and Skype, um, you know, innovation can come from Redmond and Mountain View and San Francisco and Seattle, but also Berlin and also uh, London and also New York. Um, and what's what's important isn't uh, isn't so much the, the location. It's about the quality of the products. Um, and I think about when we talked with Ed Freeze about Bungie and how important it was to keep the Bungie culture, but they had to move them down the street to Redmond. You know, today they would have stayed in Chicago. The one for me is, um, you know, translating a, a theme that we heard about over and over and over again five years ago, kind of one level up the stack. So, you know, we it's it's been out of the news cycle recently, the phrase, bring your own device, because we all know that, yes, the BYOD world is here to stay and people choose their own hardware, bring their own hardware to work. And for a long time and kind of still it's a nightmare for IT folks. I think we've taken one step further on the stack and it's really bring your own client and mm-hmm. to the extent possible for, for except for, you know, um, certain very secure applications. Um, the consumer expectation is that I choose the view in which my data is presented to me and I view that data that is from a service that is mandated. So either you choose your own service as a consumer and, you know, um, you, you choose Office 365 or Dropbox or, or you know, a variety of different mail, mail services, or like you work for a company and that company has a set of services. You don't necessarily assume that that set of services comes with a mandated set of clients. And you sort of expect, I choose my own software to consume those services. And I think for me, like the, the reason why I think that, um, that this was so important is, you know, if, if, uh, there are th- three best in class applications that people are going to choose to consume their services. Um, it, it's kind of great to own the unified experience and, and be able to provide all the, the best connections between the two or the three possible. Yeah, I think this is really important. You know, um, certainly the desktop operating system wars have been over for a long time, but you know, the mobile operating system war is over too. And nobody won like the, the, the points of, interest and um dynamicism in in computing and 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 technology the sort of technology meeting consumers and products these days it's not you know ios or android or windows or mac or um platforms uh, or even browser versus uh versus desktop versus mobile it's um it's really shifted to the app layer um and it may soon shift to the messaging layer we'll see (laughs) <laughs> no, I think there's something to, to what all of you said. And I think those are, those are all correct things. Um, for me, I don't, it's, it's hard for me in this one. The thing that if there's a theme for me, it's that good products rise to the top um, inevitably. And you look at one of these products like Accompli, like Sunrise, um, like Wonderlist, and you just look at them and you say, wow, this is a great product. And, you know, it's that excitement that we all have when we when we download a new app and it just it changes how you it changes how you work. It changes how you work with others, et cetera. And each case of these, these were products like that. So as a theme, I think it is these products well crafted by creative artists that, you know, really think deeply about how the user uses them, have that passion Um they went out and they, you know, they get that opportunity to, to be in, you know, tens and hundreds of millions of, of users across the planet. So that, that's one theme. It just seems like that recurring, that excitement that you get when you see a product like this, that's really well done. And to have that, those teams succeed by part of the acquisition, I think is one key part of it. And then the second one for me is just that we are constantly learning of what the best way to to execute these kinds of acquisitions is and we constantly get better at it and i think we as a company took another step at getting better at it with these acquisitions recognizing 
How do we keep the people energized? Um, how do we, as as you said, David, it's a global world and let's keep the teams where their families are and where they are. It's not about bringing them all to Redmond. Um, and so we continually get better about it as well. And consistent with that is, you know, we're a bunch of engineers and product people and we just love to, you know, you get these talented teams, you bring them in. And again, part of this getting better is to having them become in leadership positions too in our company and help us all get better and deliver better products as well. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, uh, there's an interesting question that comes to mind in, in just thinking about some previous Microsoft acquisitions and then, um, you know, the, the, the world that exists today. Microsoft is a company that has like a diverse portfolio of businesses across many different customer segments from enterprise to consumer and um, kind of all the way up the chain not all these businesses have aligned priorities. I mean, it, it, for Windows, it's to have all applications be best in class and first on Windows. And for, you know, Office, it's to have the best possible integrated experience across all platforms. How do you, when you do an acquisition like this, make sure that the leaders of all those organizations and that all the organizational priorities align around spending, you know, what comes to in total near half a billion dollars on um, a productivity suite that for, uh, for iOS when, when you're a, a Windows, uh, you know, an executive over in Windows? Yep. Well, you come in with a set of premises that or the fundamentals about what the uh, fundamental assumptions under which you're making the acquisition. And in this case, for these apps, it was clear the cross-platform uh, was a key part of the acquisition premise. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, one, it has to be championed by the leader of that particular product group, so Chi Lu in this case, and there has to be strong support there. And it has to be championed by the CEO as well. And so Satya has to look at the acquisition and say, you know, I like this acquisition, and Terry Meyerson I understand this doesn't specifically help you. I think it indirectly helps you by making um, our services strong and making Windows and Outlook uh, for Windows a great experience that also works on mobile devices and is relevant. Uh, Terry, relevant for our listeners, is head of Windows, right? Yeah, Terry, Terry leads uh, Windows. But there's always a balancing that happens, and you go into it not thinking that there's a, there may not be as strong a value proposition for some of the businesses as others. And any time you have a company that is as large as ours, and we're not the only one of this size, there's always gonna be this balancing of priorities that comes out. The thing that you have to, that we are constantly pushing towards is don't let that balancing of priorities mean that you're mediocre in everything. Mm. And you really have to say that, for example, in cheese business for, this, for, the, to, for office to be the leading productivity solution on the planet, we've got to have a great story around cross-platform. And so you really do, it's excellence for all. It's not about the balancing out at some mediocre level where nothing is great. God, that's a great point. That's a really good way to think about it. Thanks, Kurt. <laughs> sure. Um, should, we, uh, uh, should we wrap up? With... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, render our grades? Yeah. But before I do that, I have a I have a question for uh, for Kurt. So, you know, yeah. this this acquisition is typically too er probably too early for the ones we usually do on this show. I mean, usually we like to see a little bit of proof in the pudding that you can like look at some spreadsheets and see, hey, you know, they bought the company for this much, and it turns out, you know, there, there's a lot of other ancillary value, but we can definitely attribute this value gain to the acquired property. And there was a, a, a multiplier on the value of the acquisition for the acquirer post acquisition. Great, clean math, nice to justify. You know, we can look at Instagram being a multi billion dollar business inside of Facebook right now and being acquired for a billion and go, great investment, guys. How, with this business, you know, it, it's, it's, definitely too early to say for sure one way or another. I think we need to, to wait a few years. But, you know, how do you look at the success metrics of, you know, we, we dropped some number of hundreds of millions of dollars on this, this suite of applications. What are you looking for from a financial perspective on a, on a return? And how do you, how could you possibly measure that? You can't. And, and we don't look for a financial measurement on everything that we do. Mm -hmm. In fact, we very explicitly have a set of metrics that are around performance 
and others that are around, are we making progress in our category or, you know, so-called power metrics of do we have strength among users in using our products? And this one, the metrics around these products are all in that latter category. It's all about how many people are using and loving the product. And you can't even draw the indirect, you know, mathematical connection to greater office sales. And we don't even try. So we set mm. goals that are for these products that are around how many monthly active users do we want to have? Mm -hmm. What's the level of engagement that we want to have with the products? Because we have confidence in the premise that if those are strong users, it will pull through um, sales of office. Wow. Now, the place where we do do some measurements is around customer sentiment around, about, you know, do you, what fraction of the office users are also using our mobile clients? Uh -huh. You can also make a measurement of what the value is of a customer that is both a user of the core office applications and the users of the mobile applications as well. Or do they use OneDrive, for instance? Mm -hmm. And we do find that the value of those customers are higher because they're more highly engaged users of office. And so that if you if you want to come up with a mathematical equation, I suppose you could. We don't tend to look at it that way, but we do tend to do these, you know, conjoint analyses of of, uh, you know, if, of the connections of the different products to today and what that implies about the, the strength of that person, that particular user as a customer. Fascinating. That is very cool. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it's great to, you know, I think this is one of the reasons why we started this show is to talk about stuff like this. You know, it's so opaque what um, what acquirers are looking for and what happens to companies post acquisition. And um, it's just, yeah, it's thank you for that. And, and it's it's um, great to great to get that in, insight into how, you know, we talk about categories of acquisition uh, and we're thinking more from a theoretical perspective. But um but yeah, what what really is the you know the measurement that you guys are using for different kinds of acquisition? Yep, definitely differ, differs by acquisition. Cool. Um, grades, Ben. Grades. So I'm going to allow myself a um, plus or minus factor. That's the tolerance in which my grade can go up or down um, in notches over time since we're kind of early. And I'm going to rate it a B plus right now with a, a two notch variation. So it could go go to an A or a B minus, but it's 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 solidly an A or a B. Uh, I'm going to go. Um, you know, I've been thinking about this for the whole episode. Um, I'm going to give this an A, and I'm going to say that because I'm thinking about this in contrast to uh, we did an episode on Siri and. Ben and I were both so well. we were both quite uh, <laughs> quite harsh in our judgment of of that um, and I, and I and I, one of the reasons is clearly uh, virtual assistants and voice based computing is a um, major uh, paradigm that is important for technology companies going forward you know Amazon blah blah but um, Apple's really not done so great on that and I think about in contrast. Um, office and, and microsoft having been the leader in productivity and when these acquisitions were made really you know um i think i think microsoft was under a lot of threat from a lot of different areas from google docs to um startups like evernote to the other mail and calendar clients and task lists out there of which there were several um and here we are several years later and i am a hundred percent an apple guy um, and I love my cloud services and Dropbox and Slack. Um, and Dave, you are looking at a Google Doc right now. And I'm looking notes. at a Google Doc. And oh. yet, <laughs> Kurt Gross. You're killing me, Dave. And Sorry, yet, uh, you know, I've joked about it several times, but Microsoft basically owns my productivity on my iPhone. Um, I use Wonderlist every single day, all day. I use Outlook for iOS every single day, all day. Uh, and the calendaring features are, are, the real differentiator for it. Uh, I use SwiftKey. Oh my God. Send availability in Outlook is like yeah. the best feature. <laughs> um, and, and I, I contrast that with, uh, with Siri and I just think it's been a huge, huge win. So a lot of work to do to keep it up, but good job, Kurt. 
All right. Well, I'll take those. I think I'll take those and go grab a beer to celebrate. But uh, I hope you'll I'll help you ask me back. And uh, Ben, we can celebrate uh, you changing your grade to an A. All right. Sounds All good. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Kurt. All right. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. See you guys. Who got the truth? Is it you? Is it you? Is it you? Who got the truth now? Huh? All right, listeners, we have a longtime favorite acquired company to tell you about, Modern Treasury. Modern Treasury is the software platform that turns money movement operations into code. Yeah, for years now, services like Stripe, Adyen, and Square have enabled developers to accept credit card payments in apps. But that's only the tip of the iceberg of what a business needs to fully handle the movement of money in and out of their company. Those payment actions from Stripe and Adyen, etc., flowed through to ledger systems and then reconciliations, compliance verifications, and that's before any cash actually moves between institutions, which of course involves banking operations. Yes, their APIs of course work with Plaid, Stripe, Intuit, etc., but also with their incredible banking partner network with over 30 banks, meaning that for the first time, you literally can turn your banking operations at any of those institutions into software. This means faster payments, easy adoptions of new payment rails when they come out, like FedNow. It means automatic reconciliation and real-time financial data. This lets you move money at the speed of software, which, as we now know, after the first half of 2023, being able to move money fast is very important. Yes, we love Modern Treasury so much. The founders and really the whole team have become close friends of Ben and mine really back to when they first got started. And this is a very cool full circle moment that just happened. We just emceed their first big conference here in San Francisco, Transfer, which happened at the beginning of June. Yes. If your business involves money movement, be it a marketplace, fintech platform, real estate, lending, investing, or anyone who reconciles or moves money, go on over to moderntreasury.com slash acquired and make sure that when you get in touch, you tell them that Ben and David sent you.